Kio. Ki. Aqui. Kio. Aqui, ó. Aqui, ó. Aqui, ó. Aqui. Aqui, ó. Aqui, ó. A cerca da casa era aquela, ó. Foi aqui que caiu. Se eles morreram aqui. say something i don't say this to your audience this is either the most significant event in history or it's a most elaborate fabricated hoax i've ever seen it's one or the other there's no in between with this case either a ufo crashed and live Aliens, that's right, live aliens were walking through the town, cowering and hiding in broad daylight and captured by the Brazilian authorities. Some of them, during the capture, people that were involved died as exposure to these creatures, allegedly. And then the U.S. came in, grabbed the crash debris and the aliens and took them back to the United States. Now, that either happened... Or it's the most elaborate hoax, fabricated hoax in modern history. There's no gray zone with this case. So as someone who's investigated the phenomenon for 30 years, I myself did not believe this case back in the 90s when I heard about it, to the point where I refused to look into it. What a fucking promo. Now, I just watched that. <laughs> I'm now convinced. I'm talking to your audience because I'm serious as fuck right now. Yeah, we now. got him on the screen this. right now. I'm just yeah. watching over here. I'm, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm just saying, like, take it from me as, as someone who's done this for 30 years. I didn't believe it. I would not have spent 12 years of my life on this case on and off, gone back and forth to Brazil countless times if I didn't believe it happened. I'm putting my credibility and reputation on the line. I get it. But I'm asking you just to suspend judgment Don't draw any immediate conclusions because like I did, and I dismissed it for over 10 years. Just imagine if it did happen, how significant would you, an event, would you consider this? And, and just listen to the firsthand eyewitness testimony and draw your own conclusions. Brilliant. So I had mentioned, we had talked about this during the bathroom break a little bit ago, that this was going to be two podcasts now because I saw the length we were going and everything. So we're in the second podcast So for people who haven't seen the first podcast or, you know, because it's going to be a standalone kind of thing on its own about moment of contact in particularly, mm. when <clears throat> did this case of the Virginia, of the Virginia, Brazil UFO sighting that you are referring to first come onto your radar? It was 1998. So two years after the event. Yeah. Okay. And I was making, uh, I was starting... Uh, putting the pieces together and kind of mapping out out of the blue. It could have been 99, but I think it was 98 or 99. Excuse me. And um, I had teamed up with a couple of people. One guy that I'd worked with in the past, Boris Zuboff, who's a technical wizard, brilliant editor, technical sound design, color correction, that kind of thing. We teamed up on a couple of things. We'd worked together. And then I brought a new guy in, this guy, Tim Coleman. And when the three of us, and Tim had some resources... I was broke as a joke, and Tim also had a, a, a journalistic background. I think he was a former BBC correspondent, very brilliant guy, articulate, amazing. He's like, oh, mate, we got to look into this, this, this incident that happened in Brazil. And I, I was like, oh, okay, what, what incident are you talking about? He goes, a oh, UFO crashed. It's absolutely phenomenal. You know? And I was like, okay, a UFO crashed in Brazil? And he's like, yeah, and the aliens survived, and they were walking through the town. I went... 
Okay, I picked the wrong partner for this case. Uh, right, sure. Uh, Tim, yeah, we'll look into it. And, uh, you know, literally, that's what I did. And I just like whoosh, put him out rushed the aside. And actually, he was pissed off that I just dismissed him in the story like just like that, right? There's no way a UFO could crash, the aliens survive the, the, the impact site, be walking through the town highly populated town, get witnessed and captured. So, eh, a prox- that ballpark, how many people live there at the time? Like how big a town? 100,000 maybe? 100,000, 130,000? Yeah. It was known for coffee before this. And 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 the whole world, not, no, I'm sorry, that's just impossible. So I refused to look into it. And he was actually pissed off with me. He was like, you just dismissed me in the case. And I said, well, yeah, I, sure I did. I, You can't make that claim and not back it up. No. And so... Um, I didn't look into it. I didn't, and I did. Uh, I did two UFO. Do- I did out of the blue, out of the blue two. Then I did. I know what I saw. Then, it, uh, 2000 and, 2011, I've done all these UFO films. I'm going down to Brazil, and uh, on a on on. I know what I saw. I was going to talk about. I know what I saw. Just my UFO background in general at a conference in a place called Beruibi. Mm. I, I guess like. A couple of hours south of Sao Paulo. I'll stick that on the map in the corner. Cool. Screen. And there's an island right off the coast of Paderibi that you can see from the cafes at the waterfront cafes. And you see this island and it's got this deadly snake. It's the only place on earth that has this deadly snake. And its venom is apparently very valuable. And so these poachers would go to the island and try to poach these snakes' venom. And the snakes would drop out of trees and kill these poachers. And so that was like, we were all talking about this like island off the coast of Peruibi. And we could see it from the cafes. And I was there with Stanton Friedman, yada, yada, yada. So um, I'm there on Unrelated. I get a phone call right before I leave to Sao Paulo from a guy named Jeff Zagansky, who's been very influential behind the scenes in helping me, this independent guy with no resources, just, you know, an ambition, basically, of wanting to... You look into this whole story and all the rest of it, and and I'm, uh, I get and I'm, I respect him tremendously. He's like almost probably a billionaire. He ran Sony and big, big, big time. Look him up, Jeff Zagansky. So I have tremendous respect for him. So I'm not going to dismiss him in front of his face or anything. He picks, I pick up the phone. and He's like, "You're going to Brazil?" I said, "Yeah." He goes, "Oh, you got to look into that Virginia UFO crash case." I was like, "Fuck, not this again." <laughs> And this time it's happening with Jeff Zagansky. I was like, uh, you mean the one where the UFO, the aliens uh, survived the, the crash? That one? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you got to look into that. I was like, sure, Jeff, I'll look into that for you. <laughs> Click. <Like this. laughs> I'll just go fuck myself. Yeah, right I was like, but I couldn't tell Jeff how, how quickly I dismissed it. I was like, yeah, Jeff, yeah, sure, I'll look into that for you. Click. No intention of looking into it. I was like... I don't do crazy, okay? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> sure, there's a few people listening. They might argue that. I know, I know. 52 well, just... DC yeah. UFOs, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> so anyway, I get there at this conference, and I meet a couple of witnesses and a couple of researchers, and Stanton Friedman was there. Stanton's like, oh, yeah. Like, I looked into that case. I was like, really? He goes, well, yeah, I just happened to be in Brazil on a speaking tour when it happened, so I... I was caught up in it a little bit. I looked at, yes. He goes, wow, the fire department and police department and these three girls. And the angles. Came within, you know, eight feet of this lot. What? Like three, really? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I thought, okay, well, I have tremendous respect for Stanton Friedman. Stanton Friedman, you know, physicist, a nuclear physicist, helped uncover Roswell, like, you know, come on, Stanton Friedman, one of the best. I was like, okay, well, geez, all right. And then I met some witnesses. I met some other researchers in Brazil. And I was like, okay, maybe I was wrong. Maybe there is something to this story. Is this still 2011? Yes. Okay. Yep, 2011. Okay. So I was like, well, maybe there is something to this story. So I started looking into it. But you weren't going to include it in the phenomenon. Well... My intention was to, yes, to do that, because I, I did some filming. But as mm. I got into the case, it started getting, there were so many levels of detail. Like I talked earlier with you guys about Socorro, how many aspects of that encounter, the like the podcast, symbol. Yeah. So sorry, on the last podcast, <laughs> I talked about Socorro, and I talked about the symbol that was on the side of the craft, and I talked about the metal shavings and all this stuff. Well, all those factors 
were not included in ultimately what ended up on the screen in the phenomenon, right? You only have so much time. When did you have a moment where you're like, wait a second, I, I think I believe this. Like how long I'll tell did you exactly that, that moment happened. So I, it was 2000 and, well, okay. So I, I was suspecting something truly crazy happened. I was suspecting that. But exactly what, I don't know. But I was like, there's enough here to merit more of my time. So I went back in 2012. Then I went back in 2000, probably 13 or 14. Um, went, and then I had boots on the ground. I was working with this other guy named Marco Leal. who's was amazing. He's, he's, and him and a whole crew of others. And um, they were going back and forth. And we were constantly in contact and trying to reach additional witnesses. And I get an interview. I'm sorry if I could tell you if it was 2013 or 2014. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Probably 2013. With a general. Uh, sorry, brigadier. Air Force. Brazilian. His name is Jose Carlos Pereira. Are you doing it with a translator? Does he speak yeah. English? He spoke a little English, okay. but uh, with a translator. But he okay. did speak a little English. And um, he said, I'll give you an interview about UFOs in Brazil. But if you ask me about Virginia, this interview's terminated and I'm leaving the room. I was like, what? Yeah, you don't talk about yeah UFOs are real, but I'm not talking about Virginia. Not not you mention it, and this is this interview is terminated. Oh, Mike, could, did your head also think though potentially? Oh, he thinks that one's so stupid that he's not going to waste his time with it, or was it only like, oh shit, he's got something to hide? Something to hide. Okay, no question. So, okay. so I made him that promise that I wouldn't. So, but I was like, well, that's weird. Right, because if it didn't happen, he would just say, "Oh, that's there's nothing to that case. Don't ask me." So anyway, at the end of the interview, Jose Carlos Pereira, I've got photographs of this interview. Right? He's in the film too. He's in the moment of contact. At the end, he's dead. That's why I'm talking about this because I wouldn't. I promised him I wouldn't. I got to the point where I was almost licking this guy's boots. I mean, I'm, when I tell you that I was praying, I was like, I was doing this. I was doing this. Marco was too. Marco was translating when I was saying. <laughs> I was like, please, just please, I swear, I swear on my life, there are no recording devices. I've got no audio, no cameras rolling, nothing. This is between the three of us. I'll take it to the grave, so long as you're alive. <laughs> Did Virginia happen? What happened in Virginia? I'm looking him dead square in the eyes. I'm looking right into his soul. You got some strong eyes, too. I wanted to <laughs> fucking know if that damn case happened, and I wanted to know, and I knew he knew. And I was begging and pleading. So was Marco. Marco was right there with me. Walks back to his car. I'm begging him, please, just please. He gets sits down in the back of his car. He's got a driver. And he sits down. He leaves the door open. Marco and I were standing right there. And he looked at us and he said, it happened. Close the door. Whoosh, off he went. I was like. And then he's probably laughing on the road like, those dumb motherfuckers. No, 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 no. I, I looked into this guy's soul, man, I'm telling you. And it was like, I this guy you. confirmed it you. to me. And I knew right then and there, I was all, okay, that's pretty good proof for me. I wouldn't want to lie to your eyes. You really, you, people, yeah. I don't know if they can appreciate that on camera, yeah. but you got some you got some ice in those veins. I, I will look into someone's soul with my eyes. Yeah. yeah I yeah. will. I feel it. Yeah. And you're like poking around. It's kind of violating me right now. I might press charges. <laughs> Stop here. fucking me with your soul. <laughs> oh my god. Well, I do. I you know, I'm incredibly curious human being. Like when I hear about something, I want to get to the bottom of it. I want every detail. I want to be put on the scene. I want to experience it. I'm fascinated by this topic. I'm fascinated by this story in a way that you know, I have to t remind your audience like if it's true, if these accounts are true. Just could have something to do with it's a big part of the bigger picture of the universe yes something absolutely. to do with our existence do they have a hand in our who knows it's a meaning of life question it's if i've ever seen one it's a meaning of life question it's the bigger picture of the universe the bigger picture of reality jesus you know this is potentially incredibly significant even if we don't have all the answers this is incredibly significant and so um when I get to a witness, I don't just believe a story. I don't believe any stories. Usually I start off by not believing the stories. 
There's no way. I like that about you. You have yeah. you have a high you have a high bullshit. threshold of skepticism Absolute. and bullshit meter. I really do, you know. And and I had some people in Australia. I was investigating a landing case with Shane Ryan, Shane. Uh, yeah, Shane Ryan did a short film on it. It's about a UFO landing that took place in 1966 at Westall Primary School. And there were 365 people standing outside in broad daylight on recently. Oh, yeah, this was in the phenomenon. Fascinating yeah, yeah, case. Yeah. And there was a guy who was the English professor. I think he's actually finally come out. He'd been hiding for 50 years. And I remember the fellow researchers in the area when I arrived, don't even bother trying. Mr. Greenwood will never talk. It ain't going to happen. We've been trying for 50 years. I said, get me in the room with him. That's it. Just get me in the room with this Look guy. Look these eyes. Take advantage. Yeah. And, and, and I looked him in the eyes, uh, sitting down at a cafe. His wife had left, thank God, because his wife's like, baby, you ain't talking about this. But I looked him dead square in the eyes. And, I, and, and one of the fellow researchers looked at me and he goes, what were you doing? I said, I was looking into his soul, <laughs> you know, because I want to know. Anyway, so I, 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 it's one of my techniques because it's not like it's, it's real in the sense that I, I really do want to know what the truth is. I want to know what the person knows. I want to know if they're full of shit. I want to know. Biggest thing in life is to waste one's time. You don't get that back. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't waste my time. Do what you say you're going to do, or whatever, follow through. You know, let's not, let's just be honest here. Let's just get. And so I looked into J Jose Carlos Pereira's eyes. Very intense. I, I, I don't think I've ever taken a crowbar and pride harder than I did with him. What year is this now? Because probably 2013. All right, so this is, and you're in this is Virginia. the highest level Brazilian Air Force official I'd ever met with. Yeah, I'd met with an Air Force general. Sorry, a, a, an Army general. Got him on camera, and he he skirted the issue a little bit with me as well. <clears throat> but this guy had a soul. He had a heart and a soul. And I kind of cracked it, and both Marco and I kind of cracked it just f for a moment, just to get through. So anyway, so that, at that point, I was like, all right, this, I'm going to look into this case further because, and I had some people that I'd worked with in the past, like Leslie Kane and Jacques Vallée and a number of people, they were like, I'd be careful on this one. I mm. don't know if it seems something fishy or I don't, you know, it's like, well, I said, I, I, I get your, I know, I know how you feel. I, I, I understand. Just let me, just, just trust my judgment a little bit on this one. Let me roll. Don't, you know. And you're kind of bookmarking it because you're working on the phenomenon. You obviously are making yes. the decision now where you're like, I want to do this separately. So this is yes. going to be the next one. I, I tried to squeeze it in to the phenomenon and it just didn't happen. Didn't work. I, I tried for eight months and I shot a bunch of times and I did it. It was too big of a story. There was too many moving parts. I couldn't, I just couldn't get it down to, it wasn't like a sighting. It was a whole story of a crash. And, this, and there were witnesses that had disappeared for 20 plus years. I just, you know, so... I kept going, and I kept going, and we kept going, and I said, Marco, excuse me, we got to find the crash witness, this guy Carlos de Salza, where the hell is he? I don't know, he's been off the radar for 26 years, 25 years. Nobody can find him. I was like, well, we got to find him. What about this other guy? We got to find him. What about the, you know, somebody involved with as a military base? We got, you know, so we're going after all these, these people. And finally, we had enough contacts from over the last 11, 12 years where, I was going to go one final time and shoot. And that's when Alessi, you know, um, I guess Alessi saw me on Joe Rogan and he contacted me and said, hey, uh, love to be a part of any kind of, you know, production, whatever. And I, and I said, and, you know, I've, I've heard that many times in the past, <laughs> you know, and people don't really have the follow through. And, and for like, people that didn't see the last podcast, Alessi's in the studio with us right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. If you're just listening and not watching. Yeah, sorry. So, so, uh, so I said, uh, you know, I might do this production. I'll, you know, stay in touch. And he. How got, old were you? Twenty one. Yep. Yeah. So he got he got he got back in touch, and lo and behold, there's Alessi. You know, so I was like, okay, well, you know, we might be doing the shoot, and then and I, you know, another couple of weeks, or whatever. I'm gonna do the shoot in Brazil for a month. He's never gonna show up. Yeah. So then I said, <laughs> I tell you what, we, we're gonna be staying at this hotel room in Sao Paulo. If you show up, you you jump in the you know jump in, you'll be part of the crew. Can you? carry cameras can you do it? yeah 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 <laughs> i'm never gonna see this kid again he shows up in sao paulo gets his ass over there and boom there he is and uh yeah that and, and we shot for a solid month and we'd had contacts that we'd been 
you know, working with and talking to and sometimes even previously taken on camera for, like I said, the last 11, 12 years. So we had them kind of quasi lined up and then we had a couple of potentials that were like thinking about it, like maybe, you know, and then we had others that were like, I don't care how much money or anything you offer me, it's never going to happen. Don't even try. How bi- how big was the crew again? Like total people that you had, including five, Alessi? Five or six? Because we had E. Yeah. Dave. Yep. You. Yep. Um, Emily. Emily. Me. And then the translators. Pedro. Miranda and. And Marco, Marco Research. Crew. So we had it eight. Looks like a Pedro. Seven. It's killing seven. 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 So we had a crew of seven. Yeah. It's a good tight crew. Yeah, good tight crew, and uh, and then we had. Huh, we had, we'd found Military X. Marco found Military X. This, the guy that allegedly drove the creature on. I, I, maybe I should get into the story a little right, bit. Yeah, we so get... let, let, me, let me reshuffle the deck here yeah, so that we can. It. Hey guys, quick note for you. As I announced last week, we are officially live with the Patreon. I'm hoping to grow this community so that I can invest back in the show and put out more episodes in the future. Right now, we are featuring exclusive content over there, as well as some preview clips and some behind the scenes with me. And pretty soon, we're also going to have a patron-only Discord, as well as some other cool things. So please check out the link in the description for the page, and I hope to see you guys over there. Thank you. We can start this from the top and organize this, because the way one of the best parts of the documentary was how simply you put this together, almost like five to six ish chapters that covered from each angle i think it was like six total major witnesses that were covered here ironically so it's like six Mm. degrees of separation and they were all unrelated except for maybe one of them but let's start with carlos sosa which i I definitely knew a coke dealer named carlos sosa that's really (laughs) fucking with me but this was the guy who allegedly because you, you at least already mentioned that what generally what happened here these aliens got out they were alive people saw them in Virginia and that's why he didn't believe it but Carlos Sosa was the Virginia resident who was the, present by this field that allegedly saw the UFO come down and crash Carlos Sosa was a professor in Sao Paulo which is about five hours to the south and he was also an ultralight pilot and he oh he was he was flying the bricks yeah. he was flying them. gotcha yeah, that's his cover story no <laughs> but he was going ultra he was going to go meet with some of his friends and go fly ultralight airplanes uh, in a place called the uh, state of Minas Gerais which is also part of Virginia and as of the, the military base anyway he's driving it's super early in the morning he's going to meet with these guys to go ultralight flying <clears throat> and um, I'll put him in like, the corner of the screen so people can see him yeah I think it's like five a.m. And he uh, sees this cigar-shaped metallic object in the sky, not very high up in the, in the sky above him, uh, flying erratically, slowly. It had a huge gash in the side of it. <clears throat> he said it had like a white vapor, not like smoke that you'd expect from a fire, but like a white vapor coming out the backside. How high approximately did he say it was? Like- uh uh, I got wise. I I got the feeling that it was like a uh, thousand feet above him, maybe. Okay. Not high. He yeah. he was like this thing's coming down. Like he was, and he never once thought alien extra. Not at once. He was like, oh my god, what is this thing? It's like a cigar shaped. Did you see wings? He was like, he didn't know what it was, but it was in trouble, and he was watching it, and it was struggling to keep its altitude, and it was coming down. And then he sees it go down behind a hill. So he lost sight of it, but it was going down. Like he was like, this thing was crashing. No, no question. So he gets off the freeway and he drives up a dirt road on a farm called the Mylini Farm. And it's January 13th, roughly 5 a.m. It's dawn. 1996. Barely, 1996. <clears throat> He's driving up this dirt road in the direction of where he saw this thing go down. And he comes upon a football field size area of metallic debris, like almost like tinfoil, and then a very large portion of the craft still intact. And again, it was like, we, we have illustrations. I don't know yeah. if you have them. We have illustrations in the film. Um, and what I do for, when I do uh, 
illustrations or animations for any film project, I cut myself out of the loop. I hire an illustrator or an artist, and I put that artist directly in touch with the witness. Why would you have the witness describe to me what they saw and then me translate that to the artist? I just put the two of them directly in touch, and then they, they go at it. So he sees this field of debris and this, uh, this large section of the craft still intact. Um, and he described the whole thing when it was in the air about the size of a, of a school bus, like, you know, those big school buses. He gets out of the car, and immediately he's overwhelmed with this extreme this stench of ammonia and sulfur. He said it was so intense, he grabbed his T-shirt, he pulled it up over his face, and he held it like this, and he was like, what, you know, what am I, this, this, smell, the, he, he, this is a lot, kind of the last thing he's expecting, and he sees this like tinfoil type material, and he goes down, and he grabs a piece of it, and he said it was like about this big, and he crippled it up with his hands, and he said he didn't feel anything, like it wasn't even in his hands. It just was so light. And then he said it, when he let it go, it regained its shape, and he's like, what? You know, he's just to himself, he's like, what the hell? And at which point, the opposite direction on the dirt road from where he drew, where he drove in came these military trucks and jeeps. And I think one of them, maybe even an ambulance. And they came in from the opposite direction. <clears throat> How soon? Within minutes. Within minutes. And um, But he, he didn't say, like, it was 45 seconds or something. It was no, just, like, within minutes. Within so minutes, yeah, quickly. within minutes, yeah, within minutes. Because I didn't know if, like, maybe... You know, Tim Foyle had on here. They were tracking it, and they're like, "Oh, there it is!" And they're already there. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, un undoubtedly, that's what happened. But, okay. but in any case, <clears throat> um, and ultimately, he was uh, at gunpoint, um, told to leave. He didn't see anything. He, you know, he, he wasn't supposed to be there. You know, what all these things. So he was like, he still, he thought maybe it was a secret test program, and he witnessed something he shouldn't have witnessed. He was like, fucking left. And he was terrified scared like you know and um he gets a couple miles down the road and he stops off at a gas station i've seen the very gas station he's having he gets a coffee and he's trying to calm his nerves and just process everything that just happened and he has a coffee and he comes out and he sees an unmarked government looking car black or dark blue like an opal he described it with no license plates pull in and two men in suits get out <clears throat> and they came up to him and they knew his name, they knew his wife's name, they knew where he lived, they knew about his kid, his daughter, and like, you know, you didn't see anything. And if they, you talk they about what Brazil. you Brazil. They were all Brazilian. All that, those, I, my impression was that they were Brazilian, yes. Okay. But I didn't ask him, but that's a good question. But yes, that they definitely spoke I'm gonna Portuguese. I'm you like a cheeseburger. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they spooked him. They're like, you know, things are gonna get very weird if you talk about what you saw. Then the accounts a week later of these strange creatures is spreading like wildfire in the headlines. And these three girls that come upon in the town of Virginia, which wasn't far from where he saw this, this UFO, this thing crash, these reports coming out of these beings, these girls are talking about it, uh, these three sisters, about a week later, were walking through the town, a little shortcut in the town of Virginia, Brazil. It was January 20th. About 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 1996, three girls, two sisters, Liliani, uh, Liliani, Valkyria, and then Katya was a friend. Uh, was she older? Was Katya yeah, Katya older? was 21, yeah. Liliani was 16, and Valkyria was 14. Got it. And they were coming, coming home. It was, like I said, it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> and they were going through this, like, field that had a cinder block wall on one side and partly on the other side, almost like a kind of a, an area that looked like it was going to be constructed, but then it kind of stopped, and they had like tall grass going in the field, and they were going through there taking this shortcut. Quick question, yes. just so I remember. What time did you say Carlos, Carlos saw it? Thir the 13th. It was the morning of the 13th at around 5 a.m., 4.30. So before, before the sun Yes, about a, week, about a week earlier. 
Okay. <clears throat> yeah. A week earlier. About a week earlier, yeah. Six, seven days, yeah. Okay, so now a week later, and you do yeah, a brilliant job in, in the documentary, by the way. One of my favorite things you do is you have you have a lot of great drone shots and do stuff from above, but one of the features you have is you will put, you'll have the drone shot, like a map, like a Google Earth almost, but it's yours, and you'll put the exact location like written out so people can see where everything is in relation. And what's crazy about the girl sighting is this is in the middle of the town. Yeah. It's in like what what was it behind again at the now it's an abandoned like kind of field, but was it the same thing at the time? Like it was behind a wall? Yeah, it was like a like a it was like a lot that would, could be potentially developed that wasn't developed. And it had like cinder block walls, almost like, you know, yeah. Like one lot, and then there was another lot that was developed. And what and were they doing there? They were just taking a shortcut, going home. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and they said there was some graffiti on the cinder block wall, which is still there today. And that got their attention, and they were kind of looking at the graffiti. And then they see this, like, I, I'll remind your audience, this is broad daylight, okay? They see this thing, like, I don't know, is it, is it a statue? Like, what? It was just this thing that was... um. It was crouching down. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Uh, it was crouching down. Uh, and I don't know if I can do this without going off camera here, but but it was like like this. Yeah. Up against. Right here. Up against I the wall. It. I'll put that picture yep. in the okay, corner. Okay, that's exactly right. So it's crouching down. And Liliani, who was in the front, who's 16 years old, shrieked when she realized it looked like some kind of weird creature, she makes a gasp audible, loud, and the creature turns its head and looks them straight in the eye. Liliani grabs her younger sister, Valkyria, by the hand and hightails it out of there screaming. But they got eye contact with it from about eight to ten feet away, and she just, now she's like, she thinks she sees the devil. She doesn't know what the hell this thing is. And how did they describe the eyes? Well, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So they hightail it out, Liliani and her sister Valkyria, and they're running, screaming and running. They get about 100 feet down the, tr down the path, and they realize Katya's still there. And they, Liliani turns back and sees Katya frozen in her tracks, staring at this thing, just locking eyes on it. She runs back. She's like, I got to go help Katya. So she runs back, leaves her sister Kat Katya, and runs back to grab, sorry, leaves her sister Valkyria, yeah. runs back and grabs Katya, and grabs her by the hand, and yanks her out of there. And what was, did Katya say what she was doing so, during that time? So check it out. So I was like, oh my gosh. Like they all got face to face with this thing within eight to 10 feet away, but Katya had a prolonged face to face with her. So I said to her, put me there. Yeah. This was like your best moment in the yeah. documentary. Put brilliant. me there. During that moment of contact, in other words, and I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to revisit that title. I think I like it. During that moment of contact, when you locked eyes on this creature, this being, this thing, was there any level of communication? Did you feel anything? And that's when she said, help me, I'm in distress. I'm feeble, I'm weak, I'm suffering. Help me. And Did she, she hear a voice, or like, or was it like a? It's a you know, weird because of the language. Ask, well, but... no, because of the language barrier. Maybe I didn't get that level of. Because I said to her, "Did you feel any communication?" Well, there was no verbal communication. There was no vocal communication. So it was either done with images or it was done. Because what, what's here's another thing in that underscores how amazing the content you did get was. Yeah. This entire documentary, you're working through interpreters. Yeah. None of these people speak English. Yes. So you are, you don't know which words corresponded with which. So their body language, you're trying to read like what draws the most emotion. It's not like you're hearing it in English and we hear someone say the word alien and we can see their face right at that instant second. And you're and you're dealing with, you know, 30, 60 seconds of talking, 30, 60 seconds of tra translating, you giving back the same thing coming back around to them. So there's like this time in between and you're trying to cover all these details to get every possible thing filled in. So there's got, my point is there, even for you, there has to be some things like what I just asked that like didn't get addressed or are out there. So uh, one thing about me is that I have to have some level of community. I speak fluent French and I speak a little Spanish. 
And like, give me an example. When I was going to Russia to do out of the, when I was working on out of the blue, I was learning Russian on the airplane, basic expressions. Yes, no, yay, nay, gavru, paruski. Just like getting little, you know, uh, Pashol Nawi. No. <laughs> no. Um, Jim walks off the air. He walks, James walks off the airplane. Da. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and I cannot stand not being able to communicate. It's like so important to me. So I'm, when I was in the field in, in um, listening to Portuguese in, in Brazil, I was slowing time down with my brain. I know it sounds weird, but I, would, I was focusing so hard. I was trying harder than I've ever tried. I would try to slow time down a little bit, and I would slow the words down, and then I would take the Latin root, you know, like, oh, this sounds like the French one of this. Okay, I got a word there, terra, I got this, you know. And I was taking, probably catching one every five words maybe, slowing it down because things are going really quickly. I didn't, this didn't always happen, but... I wanted to understand so badly what was being said, man. You have no idea like how bad I wanted to understand. Oh, I do. There's a lot of memeable moments of your face yeah, is during this fucking documentary. I was just <laughs> it's incredible. Laser like focus. And then half the time, after a couple of weeks, I would translate the vast majority of what was just said in the field and the translator would go, Yeah, that that's you're really I'm like, wow, you're understanding. I was like I was understanding more and more every day. Obviously, speaking is different. You start to understand, you know, yes. first, and then the speaking comes later. But in any case, but yeah, that was all certainly an element of, of, of difficulty and another layer that I had to deal with in the field. And um, nobody, I would say, well, actually, no, the, the female interpreter, was, was she was bilingual. No question about that. She was bilingual, yeah. Marco, not so much. He's, he's pretty good, but not bilingual. Being bilingual is what it takes. Um, what, what do you mean Marco wasn't bilingual? My, uh, there's fluent and then there's bilingual. Fluent is when you can communicate primarily what you're thinking. Right, and yeah, but of, he wasn't Portuguese? He's uh, bilingual in the sense that you could speak English just as well as you speak Portuguese. You could speak Portuguese just as well as... There's no... It's seamless transition. I thought he was from there. He is from there. But he's not... His English isn't that great. Oh, okay. Now I see. Okay. Yeah, right. sorry. I was looking at the other one. Yeah, no, he's fully Brazilian. Sorry, I didn't make, clarify it, that well it. enough for you. So, uh, but in any case, um, you know, uh, and when you want to know about something that bad enough, I don't know, you, you, the brain has an uncanny ability to do amazing things. Yeah, and they... I, I had asked this a few minutes ago, but you were going through it, and I want to come back to it with with the eyes because well, who was the one? Katya was the one who was left behind. Yes, she and was twenty one years old. So she had the prolonged contact, and she had the potentially telepathic content here, yes, or, or contact here. They all felt that it was non threatening. It was suffering from the heat. It was suffering from exposure to the elements, and that it wanted help. They all, none of them felt threatened by it. They were scared of the unknown. But two of them ran. So they totally. Were scared of the unknown. They thought it was the devil, but they didn't feel threatened. I oh, because they're religious. Yeah, they're religious, yeah. highly religious. That it was the devil, the devil, and uh, but they didn't know. They, they never thought this is an ET. Never. But, but they all described in the picture. Once again, I'll put it in the corners from the documentary as well. They all described this figure with big red, red eyes, eyes. Yes. and this in a creepy way. The same way you see the kids from Zimbabwe and yeah. the phenomenon from 94 on the John Mack tapes describing the eyes, they say like three, four times the size. You yeah. hear, and you've heard some of the other cases where they say three, four times yeah. the size. They Such yeah. a similar creature. That's what these girls describe, except for once. Yeah. And this is what, I don't know if you caught this, but we, we, were, we were looking at this a couple days ago. Yeah. And I think it was Katya because she was the older one. She, at one point, was it Katya or was it the other one who said slits? It was Katya because that's the red air. Oh, she was talking about the mouth. Slit for a mouth. No, she said, but did she fuck up? Because She might have fucked up. She definitely meant mouth. No question. Because they, I asked about the mouth. I have he heard. said the mouth was like you could barely slit. see it. It was like a slit. And I have they heard. They all said big eyes. I yeah. have heard people in your other cases describe the mouth as a slit. Yes. But she said, and then the eyes like slits with oh, an S. Oh, right. And okay. so I did, that was the one time where I heard yeah. a a contradiction there. Yeah, I had because, them all draw out. Uh, they all drew it out. So she she must have she must have misstepped. Okay, definitely because she was referring to the mouth was because I asked, I said, did it have a mouth?" They all said it was like 
you didn't really see it was like a slit. Like it was not even, it was non, it was a non. But yeah. before we, before we get to the second layer though of the mom yes. coming, cause that was when it got really compelling and I want to, yeah. I, I want to go there just to recount here. You had said this was a week after Carlos Sosa yep. allegedly saw. January so, 20th. So he was, you talked about it. He was visited and everything, but after he gets to visits like that day and the day after, is he just chilling for a week and there's no creature sightings reported he, yet? He never thinks alien. He never thought UFO alien. Never. He thought he witnessed a, a, a government super secret craft. He, he didn't see any aliens. He didn't think alien. But then when he heard about the beans that the girls described, he was like, holy shit, that must have been connected to the UFO I saw crash, that thing I saw. So he gets in touch with a guy named Claudio Covo, who's a a very well-respected Brazilian UFO researcher. He's also an engineer and architect. And he gives one on-camera statement in 1996. Excuse me, right after it happened. Late January. Yeah, um, right around there. Right after this whole thing happened, he got in touch. There were other truck drivers that, 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 that come forward as well that were on camera, but I couldn't get my hands on that footage. But in any case, his daughter, Cynthia Covo, was present during the interview, you know, 26 years ago with uh, Carlos de Souza and her father, Claudio Covo, and he, he does one on-camera statement and then he vanishes for 26 years. I, with the help of Marco, obviously, get in touch. Claudio Covo has since deceased. His daughter has all the archives, including the original drawings, the taped interview with Carlos de Souza, whatever was... Whatever, whatever, whatever else he had, okay. photographs and things of that nature. She shares it all with us. And she says, I'm now a psychologist. I met Carlos right after he saw that, within weeks. He met with my father. He was trembling and scared. He was smoking cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. And she's like, there's no question in my... This is before I met Carlos de Souza. I'd seen one horribly shot, grainy-ass, terribly broken up VHS, whatever. We managed to get the original taped interview from Claudio Covo, thank God. And, uh, and she said, I'm a psychologist now, no question this guy's telling the truth. Marco had found him, persuaded him over about a year period to come forward, he did, he met with us. And, um, and then I said, I wanna take him out to the site for the first time in 26 years. And let's show that real quick, yeah. because this is this is something, you even had a preview of it in the trailer that when you first put it out before the, a couple months before the documentary. But when we talk about all these instances on, on the last podcast, when we talked about them, and when we talk about this in general, and like, you know, do people really believe, or are they bullshitting? And you know, there's always some who are bullshitting, but like, you know this guy believes what he saw. Oh, because th th God. this is this was like, you. See, I'm just gonna let the clip play yeah. so people can see this. I it have took it a us. took a long time to find the spot. All right, I was actually on the verge of give, wanting to give up. I'm not. I wasn't gonna give up, but I was like, ugh. Let's grab it. You know. What time are you but here, he's right? not. Yeah, right we gotta here. do it, man. We gotta find this spot. We've been looking for probably trees. nearly an is hour at this point. Is there a house point. down there? Yeah, there's a house. Right down like, through these trees. Right yeah. Look, I'm taking oh, out the look drone. Look closer to there then. The time, Let's drive down this the road. Let's drive it. down to get closer. There's a house. Okay. This is a, a White field. House. Yes, yes, yes. That's in a key. Key. A key. Key. We flew a drone directly over the spot, looking straight down. You look at the difference in landscape. You can see his mind, like as a oh, viewer. Yeah. Watch his eyes. Watch, just sit tight and watch his eyes. Essa árvore não tinha. Então você vê a casa lá. Aqui, ó. Veio, bateu, levantou. Right after this. Espalhou. Espalhou. Aqui, ó. Aqui. Aqui, ó. Look at his eyes right here. Let's see, we'll pan around him in a second. You can see he's like reliving it right here. Phenomenal camera work, by the way. 
hope you gave that guy a bonus. Yeah. See how the landscape yeah. looks different? That whole area looks like, well, it's just weird, and particularly with the directly overhead shot. Oh. Foi aqui. 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 A cerca da casa era aquela. Foi aqui que caiu. This is the spot. I'll cut it right there. That that is some yeah. fucking unbelievable yeah. footage right there i mean you, it, if it, as a viewer who's not there if you can't feel that i can't really help you i mean that's like uh, uh dave west is a seasoned uh director of photography he's worked with national geographic he's worked with presidents in the white house he's he's all that was one of the top three moments of he goes if that guy is lying he deserves you don't need brad pitt or leonardo dicaprio yeah, anymore greatest actor of all time yeah this guy's yeah i mean the way he just kept saying like you Lucky, lucky. Like you, you, it, you can see his brain like processing, like you know, like someone who has to go back to Very like s like someone who's suffering from PTSD has to go yeah. back to the place where their buddy died or something like that. It's the same. That was when I, so I was talking to you earlier about Travis Walton firing this guy in 1975, yeah. Snowflake, Arizona, mm -hmm. and when we went back to the site after years, he'd been there, and we did some. Uh, it's a whole other story, but we cut trees, direct proximity to the UFO, and that was one of the reasons why I took Travis. But I saw that same reaction where their eyes are open, and yet you could see, you could almost pass your hand in front of them that they were had a film strip in their mind. They were reliving that scene. Do you know what I mean? Like, you could just see it. Like, they're not, they're somewhere else. It's pretty and, intense. And, and it just, you know, for someone who had looked at this case originally and thought that this might be bullshit mm. and then to kind of get yourself to a spot 13 years later to hear about it again and be like i'm gonna look at it and then you spend two three years really looking and you're like oh my god then you have that moment where the guy's like it happened and you're like holy shit mm -hmm. and then you're trying to finish this whole phenomenon you get that done and now you're like all right i'm going down to do it you know you don't know that you're gonna get that when when people no. when people go to make these documentaries like think about What's a good all timer like the the documentary Inside Job from two thousand nine about the financial crisis? You ain't gonna get it if you don't try. Well, sure, but yeah. I'm saying like those guys they knew how the movie ended. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yep. You don't know. No. You might go down there and you might not get what you need. And you're crash like, well, and burn. We can't do it. You easily I mean? could easily could have crashed and burned. But you got it. Yeah. You know, and 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 military X. Well, so we'll get there. Let, yeah, I'm, let's, I'm gonna, yeah. Because I'll tell you how close we came to not getting that one. So the but let's let's stay with these two because yep. now I I think we have so so well covered here. Yep. We talked about the three daughters. The second layer to that I had mentioned was the mother who then you have come by. So she was the mother of two of them, right? Liliani and Valkyria. Okay, so the two younger ones. Yes. So she describes her two daughters. And Katya showing up at the house screaming. So after they had gone back and gotten Katya, yeah. they come back and they're screaming, horrified. Horrified. And she we says, the devil. take me there. Yes. And then what happens? The uh, Liliani and Valkyria, who's 14 and 16, said there's no way we're going back. So then he, she grabs Katya, who's 21, and she's begging and pleading Katya. You got it. Katya says, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. And she finally talks her into it. So she leaves Valkyria and Liliani, who refuse to go back. And she goes, jumps in their truck, and they drive a few blocks away and get to the get to the location. At which point, the mother describes this smell like ammonia and sulfur, the same smell that Carlos de Souza yes. describes. That's Everyone so describes this. Powerful. Yeah. They said if you've ever smelled a skunk at close range, multiply that by a thousand. It's almost paralyzing. That's what they all said, and it's stuck in your nasal cavity. Sometimes for days or even weeks. And she said she put rubbing alcohol. I think she was doing like vinegar and rubbing, just trying to get it, you know, out of there. And um, so she's met with that. The creature's gone, 
But the footprint, there's a footprint exactly where the girl said it was in the sand. And then she draws the footprint for us, which a lot of the witness described this. So if the foot, and this things, these things were bipedal, if it, let's just say it was like that, and it had this other digit on the side. So when it's standing up, that stabilizes it. Because if you got two, you're not going to walk very well, but it's got this other digit on the side, apparently, and that would be the imprint in the sand would have been. That's what everyone is. Sorry. Do sorry that, I that. want you to do that for the camera, clearly. Do that with your thumb again. <laughs> yeah. So like, people like can another, see exactly like another, what it is. Like another digit coming out the side to sort of stabilize it for walking. Which would say it's three. Yeah. Because you're, you're at, you're, I love this. Yeah. You're going to a major question I had about yeah. this film because like you were saying with the smell, it's amazing when you hear all these different people and in other cases, by the way, yeah. talk about sulfur ammonia like yeah. this, what it, they can't get it out for, for days yes. and shit like that. Everyone's describing it the same. A lot of people are describing the eyes the same. A lot of people are describing the size the same. Yeah. It's childlike or whatever. Big head, spindly arms, feeble. Yeah. So with this one where you have the foot, we're going to get to Military X. I don't want to give the full context there yet. People will get that later. But there's another great witness, this guy Military X, that you have later in the documentary. Yes. Who very specifically, as you point out, when he goes to describe the foot, very clearly says two yeah. digits. Yeah. But he's doing, as you just did, yeah. he's doing this with his thumb. And I yeah. watched you in the hotel room mirroring his yeah. thumb and doing this as well. And you didn't say anything, but... He was specific. You had the camera dead on his hand. Yeah. And I'm going, he's saying two, but it's really three. And I think in his mind, he's thinking those are toes and this is something else. Like an like, appendage. I mean, yeah. It's almost like a little side. If you look at it, I think a, like a chicken. Doesn't a chicken have that? Like it has a little appendage that comes out on the side. So the mother yes. describes three. Yes. But I'm going to play the scene yes, right please. now because you have the mom draw it. And she drew this fucking thing so quickly and yeah. matter of factly. I mean, it's like, holy shit, right. you know. Did you do like 10 takes with her for that? No, no, no. I know, and you know what? I had to ask. Him nothing, first. nothing in this film was staged. This all happened as it happened. In fact, I remember the DP Dave saying, "Slow down, I can't keep up." I was like, "Look, these things are happening. I'm not going to recreate. Every, you know, you got to just capture it as it happens." All right. So th this is the part where you do this. Let's let's play it at forty five twelve in the documentary. They do they do they get in the car and drive here? Do they walk here? How did they get here? And what did they see when they got here? I falou vamos lá de caminhonete. E eu falei eu não vou. She's saying, please go with me. Then I got in the truck and we parked the truck here. I'll translate. And now the mom's talking. Then we, we saw the creature and we saw the creature's footprint. I'll never forget it. By this sun, I'll never forget it. Only three fingertips. So she says three, a footprint like this. It was loose red dirt, so it was like this. And, and she's like doing it. So now you give her the thing, draw the footprint. She leans down. You gave her a table. And they say, please draw it exactly as it was. She goes, I only saw the trail by the left foot. I didn't see anything else. Watch how quickly. Boom. Get around. Boom. See, see how small that is? That's what I want to point out. Now look, the middle is huge, and the last one's big. Is she describing the appendage similarly, or was that a slip of a shitty artist where she draws it big? And now she's talking about the smell, so I'll cut it there. We already talked about that. But is she, that's what I wanted to know, because she drew it naturally, and it's like, I'm a shitty artist too. I'd have done the same thing, where you can't draw everything in perfect like uh, symmetry. Mm-hmm. Or was that literally like she was drawing it similarly to what yeah. he said, where one's small? So think of it this way: it's bipedal. We know that, right? Right. How hard would it be to walk on this as opposed to this? You have a side appendage coming out like this. Exactly. That's what. What's his name? So that's what we've all speculated. We don't have a photograph of the foot, so we can't say for sure. But according to the eyewitness testimony, that makes the most sense. And that's what. What's his name? Is almost like two. He said almost like two. Appendages. But he's doing this. Yeah, he's doing that. Yeah. They yeah. do that. So we'll, we'll get to him to give yeah. all the context. But okay, that does, I, for me, that clears that up because it was really compelling. Like how just boom, 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 boom she was with that. And you were standing right there for yeah. this, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, how much, and I'll ask you this to the side, Alessi, because we got the director over here. Let's remove the bias. How much <laughs> of when you saw the final cuts of this, obviously you guys are, are filming. I mean, 
maybe even close to a hundred hours, whatever it was yeah. over this month here. Easily, yeah. When you saw the final cut of this, was this how you saw it happen live? Was it very representative of that? Yeah, identical. It, it's one of those things. It was one of those things where when you were in person, I always say this is just like, yes, the documentary does such a good job, but when you're in person, it's just riveting. You're just like, oh my God, like they're actually drawing to this. And I'm like, what the heck? And these people day to day are just normal people. And it's like, if they're all actors or all paid Oscar winners, whatever, they are phenomenally doing a great job in day-to-day yeah. -day life doing this. Because and they're not tracking us down. We're tracking them down yeah. and begging them to come forward. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. 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 So that was, so she says that, and then she goes through what we talked about with that, with the smell, and she couldn't get it out. And I guess it sounds like she pretty much concluded right away, yo, you didn't see the devil. He's awesome. You know, this is... Well, that's the thing shit. is, is that so the the I think that's why Carlos de Souza felt compelled to come forward and share his aspect of the of the incident because he was like, "Holy shit! Maybe those girls, what they saw, was connected to what I saw. Maybe the reason why those men in suits came up and they were so adamantly scaring me not to ever talk about this, and I was at gunpoint. Maybe that was otherworldly what I saw." And that's why the excessive secrecy, and that's why the life threats, and that's why the men in the black suits, and that's what the girls saw. The creature's got to be connected. He felt compelled to give his testimony one time. And that's when he met with Claudio, Claudio right. Covo, yeah, yeah, and did that one, t you know. So I was like, I told Marco, I was like, I know this guy's been gone for a quarter of a century, but his testimony is mandatory. Like, we've got to find, we don't have a film, we don't find this guy. And so uh, we have we we do have the two farmers, Eurico and Oralina de Fretas. The and White House? Were they living in the White House? There, no, but they were they were they got woken up by their cows at night, cows and I think horses, yeah. stampeding around like two in the morning, and they saw a cigar shaped thing with a gas. Oh right, 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 yeah. right. Yeah. So, but but Carlos saw this thing hit the ground and came to the crash site. Now, can you? Oh, uh, I, oh, forget, oh, I forgot. I forgot to go ahead. Sorry, one thing. I don't know why I didn't overrule or what the, how I got talked out of this. Uh, we went in 2013 and found the farm hand at the Maiolini farm. And he talked about the neighbors hearing the boom, the impact of the boom. And he talked about the owner of the farm confirming to him that the, 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 the neighbors all heard this thing crash. It made a boom when it hit. Whoa. Yeah. And uh, we have him on camera. He didn't want to be filmed, but I had the cameras rolling, and I have it. And I think maybe that's why they talked to me out of using it. But I have the farmhand at Mylooney Farm in 2013 describing that the owner of the farm had heard from the neighbors that they all heard it, a big right. boom, on, on uh, in January uh, 1996. Now, can you... I should release that. I should put that out there. You should. Yeah. I think you should put all this out there. Yeah, I, I would know. watch the shit out of it. I know a lot of people, it'll make you a lot of money. It'll get you a fucking extra house. <laughs> anyway, but did you, when he's pointing to this and going, key, 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 I'm, not a, I'm the farthest thing from a scientist, so I don't even know how some of the sediment would work here, but I do hear all the time about people who are digging up and testing stuff from thousands of years ago and shit yeah. because stuff stays in the soil i gotta think something did unless there was a full-blown thing to where the government went in and replaced like uprooted the whole earth like is there any way to test that ground right there yeah, for so, certain material so i got contacted by a number of geologists since this film's come out um i was wondering if you can scroll to the crash site there's an overhead shot. This is rarely ever talked about. Nobody, so is crash site. I've right? had one person out of all the people that have seen the movie bring this up to me. Everybody else misses it. I picked it up, not in the field so much that day, maybe a little bit, but when I saw the overhead drone shot of the alleged impact crash site, the landscape and earth looked different than everything immediately around it. And so I was like... Let's see if you can see it. It's the it's the drone shot. Was directly it during overhead. when he was after crying? The, after the crying. It was after the crying. Yeah, okay, after so the, the crying. crying ends right there. So it just you'll see. Yeah. Oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Can you blow that up? Yeah, yeah. Because I want you, your audience, to take a look at the landscape, and I want you to see. Let me go back ten seconds. Uh, there's the okay. illustration of the craft. So that's the illustration of what it looked like upon crash. Yeah, cigar shaped. That's a hell of an illustration. There's that white house, and it was hidden by that bank of trees. That's why you didn't see that white house. Right. 
right. Okay. Now, now tell me when the landscape. pause. I'll tell you when. All right. Go ahead. Pause right there. And then, and then let it let it take take your cursor off the screen so it goes back to Let's take. Yeah, I was going to. Yeah, they'll see it. Clear. All right, here we go. Side. So, look at all this, and look. At oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. He talked about an acid on the ground, like a liquid acid that burned everything. I was like, was it a fire? Or was it? Why would but, they leave it? To, that's what I'm wondering. But it, why well, no, would... but nothing's growing there. The soil looks tampered with. It looks different. You know, it just looks different. Look. And it I does. picked that up from the drone. I never saw it from the ground. I wouldn't notice. But if you look at it from the sky, and that's the crash site, according to Carlos and according to Military X. Oh, God damn it. Right now here. they're going to go dig it up. I know. They're yeah. listening to the podcast. So, they're like, send them in. <laughs> it, yeah. So it looks different. I mean, look, man, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I mean, take a look at that and tell me what you see. Because it looks different. Doesn't it look different it all around it? It does look different. Yeah. Oh, really? And there could be other explanations, but like, you know, as a layman looking at this first glance, holy shit. I mean, yep. that's that's wild. Yeah, it's wild, all right. I mean, that's certainly So you, you've had geologists hit you up, though. Well, yes. Yeah, so I, yes. So, so uh, I went out to Roswell. Uh, I went out to the debris field in Roswell with a geologist. I'll think of his name in a minute. And he said to me, I'm a geologist... I don't care how well anyone cleans up a mess at a site, an impact, an alleged impact site. I don't give a shit how good you think you are. You could be on your hands and knees, back to back, shoulder to shoulder, go through there, bulldoze it, burn it. There's going to be debris left there, period. Look at ant, uh, ant, um, ant um, um, mounds, moles, you know, areas of runoff from the rain, like things get carried, little bits of metal, like... I did not scour. I was under a shooting schedule. I really think someone, yeah, I, I, I've heard people say they want to go to the crash site with metal detectors, with, you know, geologists and, and see what they can find. So, uh, you know, if someone's willing to put in the time and go there, I think it absolutely should be done. Absolutely. You might need, you know, permission to go on the guy's farm i don't know it's you know to be out there for months at a, at a time i don't know well as it, i'm sure we could figure that out someone could pay somebody off but yeah exactly. as as a side note here because we had talked about it in the last podcast but not gone there what was the thing in the phenomenon that you had the stanford doctor he was with jacques Vallée, yeah and he was testing the isotopes mm. that i brought up yeah. what, what was that from again uh, Ubatuba, 1957, uh, South America, uh, and, uh, Brazil. And what, so it was a UFO crash site, allegedly? It was allegedly? an alleged UFO crash. Material. Or a landing site where they a crash. Been. It was a crash. Yeah, it was like an explosion and crash, yeah. Okay, and so they were testing something with the isotopes and the whatever the fuck. But yeah, what did Gary they, Nolan. What did they find in there without, you know, going like too complicated? Like, what did they find to be able to say like, oh, this is not a part of our... Element tape, to do our with, table of elements. Something to do with magnesium isotopes that were a certain ratio that was not found on Earth. If you if you could create it, it would be in the billions of dollars, and it was 1957. So, got it. Yeah, okay. so basically like that. I'm just giving you a rudimentary here. I'm not a scientist. No, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Basically, that's good. Yeah. So we, it would be cool if we could do something like that here. Anyway, but yeah. we've so we. I covered... think it's a great idea. I think there 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 are other people that right now today. Are, are are doing background research on this case with the documentation that we do, do have. For instance, the death certificate from the guy that captured the, one of the creatures, which I know we haven't gotten to yet. So We're, we're going to get yeah. there. So who was the guy who you featured in the film who died in 2014? He was a doctor and a famous UFOologist. Dr. Roger Lear. And he had investigated this for years and even done some, not with the people you got, he but he had done there, some interviews, right? He went there in 2002. At the time, there was a very famous researcher by the name of Ubarajada Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. He's also a lawyer. He's one of the top lawyers in the whole district of Virginia and the state of Minas Gerais. And Ubarajada Rodriguez wrote the book on it. He was super smart, man. He was in debates with skeptics, and he would just annihilate everybody. He was super smart on the case. He had very deep contacts. He was working with a guy named Victor Peccaccini, who's also a bright guy. Peccaccini. Done a lot of, lot of research on this. And 
Uba Najara had not yet gone quiet on the case because now he won't talk to anybody. Mm. And that happened, I think, uh, gosh, guys, I, I want to say 2005 or 2006, something like this. Well, he got a visit from Tommy Lee Jones. I'm sure he did. And yeah. so he went quiet. He, went, he agreed to meet me for coffee, and then he said, no, I can't do it. I was like, dude, we're going to meet for coffee. I'm not going to put you on camera. Like, come on, man. Like, wouldn't do it. So... Um, uh, sorry, where was I? Because I was talking about Uber Jara. Um, give, hit me the question. Sorry. As far like what I wanted you going into next? Yes. The guy, Roger Lear. Oh, yeah. The, so, the guy who was doing the so, interview. So sorry. Yes. No, you're good. You're, so good. Roger, you're doing great. So Roger Lear finds out in 2014 that I was covering, or 2013, that I was covering the Virginia case, and he was desperately, I was in Los Angeles, he was in Los Angeles, and Roger Lear was like, I gotta get you, you know, I got, I'm so kicking myself, this is the guy that died. Mm. Uh, one of my biggest regrets <laughs> on this case. So Roger Lear doesn't tell me, hey, I've got cancer and I'm dying. Oh. He's just like... Well, that's his fault. I, yeah, I, I would have made it a top priority, yeah. and I was trying to, but I was organizing all the, 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 the flights for the um, Rua Zimbabwe UFO landing in 1994. Yeah. I was doing that, and I was doing other interviews as well in Los Angeles, and I'd rented this big house, and I had camera crews, and... All this stuff was happening, and I was my focus was also on Virginia, but not at that exact time. And I had very busy shooting schedule. My voice was gone. I was like working so hard. You're in debt. I was always totally in debt. Yeah. I had a guy named Larry Fischella at the time. It was who was funding stuff. So, but it was anyway. And and all the while this is going on, and Roger Lear is like, you know, got to get me in an interview. Got to get me an interview. Got to get me an interview. I know this case. He didn't say to me. I went there in 2002 and I had unprecedented access with Uber Jar and all this other shit that went down and I wrote the book, you know. He didn't say all these things to me. I was just like, and then he got upset and I was like, I was a rear, I said, Dr. Lear, please don't, you know, don't take this personally. I'm so, I'm so busy. He goes, well, I'll be there next if you're year. not going to meet with me, <laughs> if you're not going to meet with me, take my tapes. I was like, oh, okay. And he goes, I went there in 2002 and I got all these tapes. Take them. I was like, okay. I took, took the tapes. I made them all. I copied them all. It was shot on uh, D, uh, mini DV, you know. Holy little shit! Little mini DV or high eight? It was probably high eight. I didn't really, I didn't realize he gave them to you back then. He did. He gave them to me in 2013. 2013. No question, it was 2013. Gives me the tapes. I make copies, and I send them back to him, and he dies like a week later. Oh. And I was like, shit, you know. And then I'm reading. So, you know, move forward in time. I'm trying to get Uber Jara Rodriguez. I'm trying to find Pacchini. Pacchini is one of the UFO researchers. Co Claudio Covo is dead. Uh, Carlos de Souza, the UFO crash witness, he's gone. Nobody can find him. Pacchini's vanished. Uber Jara's done a 180. He won't talk to anybody. I'm like, Jesus, like what? You know, we're trying to dig into this case and we're just hitting, like, you know, dead ends. So I'm like, whoa, I've got Dr. Roger Lear's tapes. I forgot about that. So I mm. whipped those puppies out in like 2020 or 2021. No, 2021. Maybe 2022, but 2021. Was it before or after you went there? It was. I think it was after. But I knew I'd had them and I'd spot checked them. But I, just, I, I kind of forgot. Like I, I was like, I got his tapes. And there he is in Virginia in 2002. And he's meeting, and he's working directly hand in hand with Uber Jara. And Uber Jara is fully transparent. I mean, he's all in at the in two thousand two. This is what say? happened. This is where the military recovered. This is where the capture happened. This is where the girls saw it. And he's introducing him to the girls. He's introducing him to the military officer Marco Cherizzi, who's who died after allegedly We're capturing gonna go there these next. things. Going to yeah. go there next. He's got it all on tape. I'm like, oh my god. Then I find out that he'd written a book too. So I get this book. This kills me. Uh, I get the book. In the book, I've got the tapes. So the book mm -hmm. is a direct transcript of all the interviews that he'd done, basically. He just extracted the interviews that he'd done on camera and put them in the book. Then he mentions in the book, about three quarters of the way through, that he has this meeting with Uber Jara and a couple of doctors from Humanitas Hospital that he wasn't allowed to record on camera. He couldn't bring any of his recording devices in there. This was off the, 
well, say maybe it wasn't off the record, but no recording devices. And they had to be like anonymous. So he meets these two doctors. Now I know that his book is accurate because I've got the tapes of the interviews and all the people that he met with and translations and all that stuff. Uber Najar has got his son there who's bilingual and his son is doing like in the field translation immediately. He's so bilingual, like the guy's perfect, fluid, that totally was, like yeah, that was the dude on seamless, the right side of, seamless. Yeah. And in the book, Ubudajara, who won't talk to me and won't talk to anybody anymore, Ubudajara takes him to meet these two doctors that were a Humanitas Hospital. Okay. Now I know the history with Humanitas Hospital and the fact that the creatures ended up there and blah, blah, blah. So I, I'm pretty sure I'm feel, feeling very confident that if he says Humanitas Hospital, that I know that the creatures at one point, at no, not sure how long, but they were there. So, and one of them was captured alive because I, I know that too. He claims in his book that he meets with these two doctors that had worked on one of the creatures in the hospital and that I didn't put any of this in the movie because I don't have anybody's testimony other than a book. That's it. I can tell you, and you guys could take it with a grain of salt. You can believe it. You can not. No, that works. It. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So Good according call. to these doctors, that that Dr. Roger Lear uh, accounts in his book, these two doctors during a procedure, they, the the creature had a, a a wound somewhere. They were trying to fix it, do something, a leg, broken leg, something, and um, all of a sudden the creature kind of comes more to life. It was alive, but it kind of comes to life and it communicates with the two doctors telepathically. And again, this is according to Dr. Roger Lear's book, that Dr. Roger Lear heard the account directly from the two doctors at Humanitas Hospital who were there and, and experienced this. His word against everybody. Yeah, well, it's exactly, yeah. and he's dead. Yeah. So, yeah. And there was another guy in the room, there was a guy that traveled with, with Dr. Roger Lear and I tracked him down and he had just died. So I didn't get his testimony. He was also in the room. So the only person left in the room is Uber Jara, the two doctors, which I have no idea where they are and Uber Jara's son and Uber Jara won't talk to me. And apparently the telepathic communication was, I feel sorry for you humans. You have no idea about your potential, who you really are. Yeah. That's what it said. Holy According shit. to the book and, Dr. Roger Lear and the doctors. Yeah. So I, I was like, I contacted people that knew Dr. Roger Lear. They said he doesn't make stuff up, that he was a solid witness. I said, look, I can vouch for the whole book except for that because I don't have those tapes. Well, good. Again, good of you to not put that in the documentary because that's a heavy thing and you can't. I can't do prove your it. Full proven. Yeah. C couldn't prove it. So I did. I left but it that's out. That's wild. Yeah. If I would have gotten testimony from someone who heard it out of the doctor's mouth, I might have considered putting it in. But I couldn't. And Roger there, Lear was dead. The other doctor that was with him was dead. It was on the tapes. I mean, the two of them were having a good time. They were, you know, they were admiring the, the food and the coffee and the beautiful women of Brazil and the architecture. They were having a great time. It was like a road trip. They were having a fun time, the two of them traveling together and meeting with Uber Jara and, and then meeting with the witnesses. And it was so nice having that translator in the field with them because all the videotape stuff I could instantly know what was being said because the guy just did you know on the right fly right. translation yeah. and maybe i'm getting my brain mixed up right now because there's a lot floating in there about this but did this situation involve a total of two creatures one dead and one alive maybe more maybe more but, but there were at least two no question okay but we so, think up to five so this but is we, we don't know because we covered the already the girls who saw the alive one in the abandoned field in, in the town and against the wall. And now we're going to get to Marco Cherezi. Yes. And before we do that, we got to get you an Uber because you have a flight to catch. So everybody go like and subscribe if you haven't already. And we're going to stop for a second, get you taken care of, and then you and I are going to finish the second half of this case. Roger we're that. Done. So we'll be back right after this. All right. We are back on. So... Marco Cherezi, that was where we were going next. Before we get into exactly what he did, who was he? Okay, so Marco Cherezi was a military officer uh, based in the town of Virginia. And um, military police, I say military police officer, because 
the police and the fire department in Brazil are connected to the military. So if you're in the fire mm. department, you're part of the military. Really? So it's like 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 a military police, I guess they call military police. So if you're in the police department, you're part of the military. It's all connected, you know? And um and he'd grown up in Virginia along with his buddy uh, Eric Lopes, who's also military police in Virginia. Get to him. Okay. So Terezi is the one guy, like I mentioned, you had roughly like six degrees of real separation with this across the different witnesses. It was somewhere in that neighborhood. But Terezi is the one guy who you had to interview his family because he, he died in 1996 yes. right after this. So yes. let's get into what happened. He was this a is... part of the military and then this day yeah. happened. So this is uh, one of the sadder aspects of of this story and i don't think it was uh anything um like evil or anything like that but reportedly what happened was you had the girls january 20th three o'clock 1996 in the afternoon and you saw where they came in contact according to them with an unknown creature that you showed earlier in the in the podcast, yes. okay? Yeah. So I flew the drone over every area, any place of interest, any any witness. Uh, I would always fly the drone over the top, so you can get a perspective from the air of like where these events happened. And for the first time, we put together, and I've talked to this about the, with the Brazilian researchers that I worked with. Nobody realized the proximity between military blockades, girls encounter. Marco Cherizzi, military police officer, mm -hmm. who's driving around with Eric Lopes about 5 to 5.30 on the same day, two and a half hours after the girls saw what they saw, ish. And apparently, Eric Lopes was on duty. His really good buddy, Marco Cherizzi, was not on duty. Eric Lopes had a special mission of being on the lookout for something incredibly unusual. He was not told there's an alien on the loose or anything like that. Be on the lookout for something unusual. And it's a special operation. Excuse me while I have a sip of this coffee. So Yeah, we reloaded you downstairs. Gotta keep you awake. Yeah. So You're doing great. <laughs> so um he goes by his buddy Marco Teresa's house and he says, Hey, who's who's married? And I think his wife was even pregnant. And he says, Hey, I got this special mission, blah, blah, blah. You were on the lookout for something unusual. Do you want to come with me? And he says, Sure. And he jumps in the in the passenger seat and off they go. Well, they're driving down a road, which is just a couple of blocks away from where the girls saw this creature, reportedly. And this strange looking creature scurries across the road right in front of their car. It was exactly the same description as what the girls had seen. Eric Lopes, the driver, screeches on his brakes. Marco Cherizzi leaps out without a moment's hesitation, chases this thing down, doesn't put up hardly any bit of a fight, captures it with his bare hands, and carries it back, and apparently puts it on his lap in the back seat, and they drive it to a clinic, they get to the clinic. They have no idea what this thing is. They get to a clinic and it smells and it's oily and brown skin. And and the, apparently the doctor at the clinic was like, well, I don't know what the hell that thing is. Get it out of here. I want nothing to do with any of this. So they ended up at a regional hospital and then ultimately a humanitas hospital. A couple days later, that day, uh, apparently Marco Shreezy has got this oily, smelly, oil grease stuff all over his body and it smells and it's just irritating that ammonia sulfur kind yeah, of yeah it's just and it's he apparently got rubbing alcohol and he's rubbing his body down with rubbing alcohol and trying to get that smell that greasy oily smell off of him and he's not like he's not like apoplectic or not apoplectic he's not like in total shock that he just picked up a fucking alien who knows man who knows well, i mean well, i we can't limited yeah, we got limited information from his sister and, and fellow researchers. But, but getting back to, he, after a couple of weeks, starts having immune system issues. And, oh, by the way, he got like a, he got a, a cut, a little gash, not a big one, but apparently during the capture, just a little scratch, like right under his arm, right in here somewhere. 
And um, was this at night that he captured the creature? Captured it in, in the late afternoon, early evening, five five thirty. So it's not o'clock. dark. No, not totally dark. Now he gets. I, I want to go back to that real quick, just so that January everyone out there is, can understand. January is summer in in uh, in Brazil. Okay, so he gets out of the. Eric Lopes is driving. Yes. Crazy's in the car. Yes. He sees this creature and goes, stop. Runs they out. They both did. It ran right across the road in front of him, right in front of the car. And was it trying to run away? Yes. And he was just fat because it's small it and he was a lot and faster. Yep. And no question. Did barely put up a fight. Uh, barely put up a fight. And he put it in his hands and was it like flailing around or? He grabbed it, put it on his lap. That's the, all the details I have. And then he got a scratch in the process. Okay. So it was fighting back Small a scratch. Bit. Yeah. Okay. Small scratch. Okay. So um, apparently he he uh, takes himself to the hospital. His uh, family's notified, his mother and his sister. His sister goes in, Martha Tavares, T-A-V-A-R-E-S, Martha, Martha Tavares. And, um, and meanwhile, these stories of are exploding. What the girls saw, there's information getting out about the crash of the cigar-shaped UFO. I mean, it's spreading like wildfire across Brazil, across different parts of the world media frenzy there's all these people asking sister he's in the hospital and um she i guess he he says to her like you know find out what's going on i i feel okay but my immune system and and the doctor's like uh we, we interviewed the doctor as well who worked on him um cesario he said that he'd never seen Anything prior in his 20 years prior or his 25 years after, he'd never seen anything like it, mm. where you get an infection from a little cut and he's and the antibiotics aren't responding and there's something in it that he's never seen before. He's just never seen 23-year-old perfectly healthy with an infection that won't go away. Was Now, was the doctor, in, in speaking with him, was the doctor certain that the actual cut itself was infected and therefore that's what was causing it. No, it was in his bloodstream. Okay, all right, keep yeah. going. I'll ask about that later. Yeah. Okay. And um, there's more research that's being done on this as we speak. So there's people that did the autopsy, the people that, that wrote the autopsy report, there's the death certificate, there's a number, there's a paper trail here that we're, we're following up on. There's people... Okay. In the, in the media that are actually going after this quietly behind the scenes. And once they did make a determination as to a better assertion of exactly what happened or if there's any kind of indication of, of a foreign substance in his blood, this will be coming out in this year. So in any case, so um, Marco Trezzi gets his infection. Uh, the doctor treats him with antibiotics. Nothing's responding. He literally said he threw the kitchen sink at him. Marco Trezzi dies. The other doctor that was on duty that day... How, how many days before he died? Uh, I, you know, he went to the hospital. Within a couple of days, he was dead. It wasn't many. And it was like a week or two later, you said, he went to the hospital? Two and a half weeks after, yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, she said all the media frenzy and Marta sat by his bedside. and it, It's a story of this E.T., true. And he said something to the effect of, uh, this is going to be out one of, a really huge, big deal. This, this, there's a lot more to this story, something like this. And according to his doctor, he was revealing what had happened to him because he knew he probably might be dying, and he wanted the doctor to have all the details possible. But then the doctor kind of says this on camera. You could probably find it in the film if you wanted to. And then kind of backpedals and said, but he was, you know, he was not allowed to talk about any of it. This guy right there? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, that's okay, it. Okay, let's play this real quick. So we're going to cut to 4843 of the dock. Uh, I got to turn I got to turn the volume on. Yeah. Sorry. Hold on. 4845. We said that oh, he this never man, that's AJ saw he just died a couple weeks ago. Medical this guy. career anything what like happened? that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Hold on. So this is And that infection killed him. Boa tarde. É, meu nome é Cesar de Furtado, sou médico. And this is the doctor. This is the doctor my name is whatever. I'm the doctor. I'm an intensive care internist. I've been working in the city for 45 years. In 1996, I was here when the event, the appearance of extraterrestrial beings occurred in the city. I had to attend to 
O Marco Cherezi, Marco Cherezi que foi o militar que, military officer, se diz, people say, envolvido no caso, was na época, in the case at the time. e a gente and we o levou para o CTI, took him to the intensive care and did all the treatments, e ele veio but he died de uma causa from an undetermined cause, uma causa a case unknown at the time, por nós by us doctors. So he didn't know about the alien case. He well, just, Right. Oh, right, because you're saying... Yeah, 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 yeah. the witnesses that claim that Marco Cherizzi handled a creature, a strange creature, it doesn't have to be from another world, it was a strange creature, he gets some unknown infection, you did everything you could to save him, and he died. Do you believe that there's some credibility to that story? Yes, it's a credible story. He exposed this. Oh, shit, he's got himself, you're right, to reveal what happened, to try to help himself, to save his life, because he felt he was dying, and according to his sister, he was restricted from talking about it. Okay, do you want me to cut it there? Yeah, sure. Okay, so we're going to go to the so sister now. The doctor, you saw what just happened there. The doctor basically is like, he was knew he was probably dying and he was revealing what really happened because you know what's he going to do worry about his secrecy or die but does that mean the doctor was aware of the case itself oh everybody in the whole town knew of the case there wasn't a single person that lives in virginia that doesn't know about the case at this point so at the point, doctor yeah. could have put two and two together like oh, could have yeah for right. sure yeah, okay for sure. i see what you're saying but now. i mean word traveled and it really came from the three girls because everybody believed the girls. I mean, first of all, there was a military presence in the town of Virginia, in and around the town of Virginia, that no one had ever seen before. There were military blockades of roads they couldn't get through. There were threatens with gun, at gunpoint with, with, with people who lived at residents, that I live in that house right there, let me through here. No. Yeah. And they, no. You know? Yeah. Hold Three o'clock in the afternoon, you got a gun to your face, you can't go home? Like, really? What the fuck? You know? And then I got the local media guy, not n n um, Ned, Ned, Nedia. He's on camera. Yeah, the guy with the bald guy who was yes, bigger. Yeah. Yes. So he, he's the media, TV presenza, presenza. Yeah. You know, and he's like going out. He hears about the girls, and he's going. He's like he knows the town. He jumps in his car, and off he goes. And they threaten him. No. no. And he's having media ask people at the Meza military base about these reports. You ask one more question and your men are going to jail. We're, we're going to talk about Essa. Yeah, this is a national security issue. You are not going any further beyond this point right here. Did the, did like the mother... Like, the hell? Did the, didn't the mother say, maybe I'm mixing this up, so correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Didn't the mother say, like, quote-unquote, men in black visited her home yes. and, and the girls yes. a few days later, and they were literally, like, men in black, who yes. one of whom spoke, the other three didn't, yes. and he spoke Portuguese and said, you can't talk about this? Uh, oh, tried to get him... To be, okay, so let's back up a little yeah, here. Please. Yeah, please. Because I'd heard... If, if I talk to your audience, address the so-called men in black issue, um, we could go on for 12 hours, because I could give you accounts that I'd heard dating back to the 50s, and then the 60s, and then the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Cases, specific cases that I've investigated. Military men that I've talked to, civilian witnesses that I'd talked to about these so-called men, dark suits that show up and intimidate witnesses, blah, blah, blah. I've never included any of the testimony in any one of my films because I felt it was a slippery slope, and I didn't, I couldn't prove it, and it just seemed too weird. I was like, man, in black, what the fuck? Think about Will Smith. No. Do you think if they had never made that movie, though, you wouldn't be thinking like that? Well, when did that movie come out? Maybe like 96, 97, okay, well, maybe? Uh, Somewhere in there. Because I first heard about him in 97, so maybe. Fuck, I don't know. But in any case, I avoided it like the plague, okay? When I got to Brazil, and the mother of the two daughters, the, the, her two daughters mm -hmm. that came in contact with that being whatever mm -hmm. when she told me that story i was so profoundly moved i finally said the hell with it i'm gonna i'm gonna include this testimony in the piece and i don't care what anybody thinks if anybody can attack me or come at me james is reporting on men in black whatever Look, it was very not, subtle it wasn't yeah. you, you weren't like but i left a it ton in. of attention yeah I, I left it in yeah i left it in because i believed her 
and I'd heard enough testimony from both civilian and military over the decades. I said, that was the, it was a straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I said, okay, I'm going to put this in. I'm sure I'm going to get criticism for it, whatever. James is reporting on men in black figures now. Like, you know, you know, I get it. And what exactly, like we kind of said it, but like, were there any crazy specifics that she mentioned that really stood out to you about what they said? Yeah. They had a briefcase full of money, foreign bills, probably U.S. dollars that she could leave, but she had to get her daughters to go on news stations and say they were lying and that they made it all up. And what they saw was just like a homeless guy or something like that. (laughs) And the mother refused and they did it. Like, I mean, she said they were kind of scary. Like they were very intimidating and that one of them spoke and the two others just sat there quietly. And I think she said they took notes. There's Either two others, notes, not three others? Two others. There was okay. three in total. And, um, and they were intimidating and they were forceful and she was scared. And uh, she finally threatened to call the police and they, they ultimately left. And she said, I'm not going to, I'm not, my daughters are not liars. My daughters are not lying. I'm not taking them. I'm not going to go relocate in some other foreign place with whatever money you're trying to give me. Why wouldn't they kill them? Oh, God, that would have been such an obvious cover. I mean, because those girls were everywhere. They just killed all three girls and the mother. Oh, yeah, because they've already gone on. They were all over the place. They were all over the news. All over the news. Those girls made this, they catapulted this. Everybody believed the girls. Why did they let it get to that then? I think it happened so quickly. You know, and look, the the cover-up... I'm just trying to poke holes. Yeah, no, for sure. And and look, there were... Everyone of the town, like... It's one of the reasons why I went down to the town square. It seems kind of silly and lighthearted, whatever, but I did it because if an event of that magnitude had happened, surely people of the town would have some sort of information, heard something. Right. And so, and, and it's exactly what happened. Oh, my cousin saw this. Oh, I saw, like, later that night, I saw this flying saucer looking, you know. So military trucks, you know, unprecedented. We don't see military trucks in downtown Virginia. That never happens. Like, you know, there were cordoning off the hospitals like you know so and that's what that's what uh carlos Souza was saying too men well he talked about the men in dark suits that, yes. that he said it was scary like i mean it was like how the hell they know all about me they knew about my wife where i lived my daughter like everything he said it was terrifying so back to back to Cherezi. yeah you get this doctor to backtrack and i think i saw it i see what you're saying i thought at first, when you were saying, but he backtracks, like, he was going to admit, like, accidentally that, like, he knew all about what the guy told him. But didn't you also, God, there's so much going on here. Didn't you also say in there <laughs> that the, that the do- like, this was maybe 15 minutes ago, where you were like, the doctor allegedly was told things at the bedside by Cherezi? Yeah, so he slips up. Right there, the segment that you just shared with your audience. But he said the sister, He's- no? He said he revealed what happened because he was fearful for his life. To his sister. And then he says, according to his sister. But no, it was according to, because he kind of catches himself like revealing too much. Then he oh, says, oh, according oh, to his sister. Oh. Uh, 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 no. Uh-uh. He revealed what happened because he was worried. He was, dude, he was dying. Yeah. And the doctors couldn't fix him. What happened? Why are you sick? Of course he's going to tell me and he, t- he says so right there you know so and he dies and the and the other doctor according to the family said we got to put him in the ground immediately like no memorial service no nothing the put him in the ground did. yeah the doctor was on duty that day when he died the doctor that was on duty said got to get him in the ground like immediately okay we're gonna we're gonna skip over the radiologist and military x and we're gonna come back to them yep what we need to do is where you almost essentially like close close to closed out the documentary here, which was with Eric Lopes. Yes. And I want to go there because Eric Lopes, as we've highlighted, was the driver yes. of that car. Now, Eric Lopes, as you found out and you're going to describe in a minute, is alive today. Yes. Where I may disagree with you, I'm not going to say like, oh, it's impossible that the alien... Infect, infected him with something and that's what killed him and is it possible that that infection could have absolutely really shown up and shown teeth two weeks later because it settled in and that got his bloodstream and he died absolutely but I, I 
tend to think, especially given the fact that this guy was talkative at his bedside and his sister was involved and whatever, I'm more of the opinion here that he was polonium or something poisoned by people from the government who were afraid he was going to speak. Why, the, why wouldn't they have killed uh, Eric Lopes at the same time? Because, and I may have misunderstood this, so correct me here. I think Eric Lopes, two things, was somewhat connected within the military by family. And secondly, he also kind of proved the point because he shut the fuck up. He didn't say shit to anybody. And let's dovetail that before I get your response to that. Mm. Can you describe how you got in touch with Eric Lopes and then what happened? Yes. So I'm like, these accounts of capturing a live alien with your bare... First of all, I believed the girls. I wouldn't have gone any further. I mean, I really believe the girls' testimony. And then you've got these accounts that were just a few blocks away from where the girls are at 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And I, I was like, there are only two witnesses, Marco Shreezy and Eric Lopes. Mar Shreezy's dead. We got Eric Lopes left. We got to find Eric Lopes. We got to get him on camera. We got to get a statement. Everybody was like, that's never going to happen. This, he's completely gone off the radar. He won't even talk to the family. He won't give a statement. He was good friends, Eric Lopes, with Marco Trezzi. They grew up together. Mm -hmm. Eric Lopes fell in love with Marco Trezzi's other sister, not Marta, and ultimately married her. Okay? Mm. She is, her brother died. Okay. Her brother died, and she married the man who's the only other living witness. They're together. <laughs> we decide, I went to the mayor, Mayor Vergi, in the active mayor, not retired. And he was incredibly transparent on the case. He talked about the witnesses that he'd heard and seen and met, and that he believed that this story happened. Okay, The mayor says this on camera, which is a pretty big deal. I don't think it's ever been done before. Yeah. So the mayor was like, well, whatever I can do to help. I was like, mm, let me think about that one for a minute. So I said, yeah, we'd like to uh, find this guy, Eric Lopes. Nobody can seem to find him. He's been off the radar. We can't get any statements out of him. He goes, I'll help you with that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So he arranges from the former, I think it was like a police sergeant or chief police in and around the area in Virginia. I got him in the film. He... He says, yes, go meet this guy. He's a friend of mine. He used to run the chief plea, whatever. We found his address. We're going to take you out there. And it was him. I, I, I have the specifics. It was like sergeant police, you know, and I show him in uniform back from 96. And then his son, who's a, who's a very famous lawyer, used to be a politician in Virginia. When we were standing in the town square, people would drive by. They were honking and waving and shouting. And the guy was clearly homolo. He was very famous. And his dad. They were going to take me out to the location. I was following him in his big executive black Mercedes and, um, and then just dropped me off. And then I was on my own. Like, here's his house. Good luck. Well, I, had, I always listen to this little inner voice. I, I, I always listen. I never ignore it. Sorry, this thing's Oh, the thing on. went out? Go, no, uh... no, it's good. I got it. Oh, it's good. Yep. I always listen to this little inner voice, and I thought to myself... Hmm. I don't think I should walk up to this guy's house solo. I think I should have some locals that, that have known him and grown up in the area. So just as we were about to follow this black Mercedes out to the house, I stopped and I got the translator and I ran up to the car. We, we're all like ready to go. I said, hey, um, Homolo, would you mind getting out of the car and walking up to his front door with us and helping do this thing? And I honestly think... And you can call me crazy all you like, but I honestly think that might have saved my life. I, I, I don't disagree. I, I really think that could have been a very deadly, serious situation because even the local researchers that had balls, like Peccacini, who packed a gun, and like and he'll tell you some crazy stories during his time, he wouldn't go near Eric Lopes. Eric Lopes, the military police, like, uh, you know, armed to the teeth, no doubt. And um, is he still active in military police? He was up till fairly recently. Okay, you know that from a Facebook page. And so, uh, I, I honestly think that was a very wise decision that I made in the field like that. 
we go up to this guy's house and the first thing well first of all I mean, you have to, you want to play the scene or? yeah I, ha I have it up yeah and, and this because... is where this is where alessi who just left actually came in pretty clutch from the car because he came you had just to set it you walked up you had the translator you had the guy who brought you there and you had i think two cameramen with you right yeah i had i had uh david i had the sound guy and the sound guy is funny if you look at the sound guy carefully sound guy is brazilian he's from like rio i think and he can listen. He's got headphones on, and he's got his boom mic, and he's got his boom mic pointed out to the guy's yeah. mouth so he can hear what's going on, right? Right. And you don't know what Eric I, Lopes looks this like, is, by the way. No, I don't know what he looks like. Yeah. I'd heard about Eric Lopes for years, over a decade. So, But when you're walking up, Alessi, Alessi and Marco are in the car. Yeah, Marco wasn't getting out of the car. Marco was terrified <laughs> that bullets were going to start flying. Marco had known through the fellow researchers and through his own efforts that this guy could potentially start shooting everybody. So right. Marco stays in his car. And then this happens. I'm going to play it yep. at 1.30.14. Oh, God, you missed driving up to his house. That part is really I saw, good. Yeah, it was like it was like sixty hey. seconds before. I wanted oh, okay. to be too long. Right, I give right. away too much. Got it. Make people watch that. But this is when you're up to the window, yeah. and there's a figure, and the translator's saying it's about an ET, and then they're saying he won't talk. Why'd you know? No. And then he what says, was, "I'm going to remove you with bullets." And this is in Portuguese, yes. so you don't know what he said. No, I don't. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I don't even know who he is. And you're like, it's all good. He's like, you're going to get in trouble. He's in the window. We can see him, but it's far away. This is Eric Lopez. And now you're figuring out this is Eric Lopez. Please, let me ask a question. Please. Pergunta. Por favor. Can I ask one question? He's cocking a gun. He's Brian Lopez. Oh, okay. He goes, I will kick you out with bullets. What? Hold on, hold on. Just ask him one question. I didn't know what he just said. He said, You're like, no, no, I need my question. <laughs> Guy's like, hold on. You're going to get in trouble. Well, I'm loading my 45. Will he ever come forward and make a statement? You would have gone out a legend if he shot you right here. Oh, I'm not going to lie. I'm glad he didn't shoot you. But And she's still talking to him with a straight face. If you think Lopez could, he goes, I am Lopez from the window. What's happening? So now this is Alessi in the car. This is the house Alessi and Marco. of Lopez. Yeah. But... He doesn't like to talk. So now back to you. And Alessi's going to bring the camera up. You can see my face. I'm just trying to figure out what the hell's going on. They didn't tell me. I didn't even know it was Eric Lopes. I thought maybe it was. Now we got Alessi walking with the camera. Yeah. See the audio guy? Yeah. See the way he's kind of peering out? See, yeah. He's not getting... Because he can hear. People on YouTube and Spotify can see this right now. If you're on Apple or Amazon, you're going to have to check it out on video. At some point. So Eric, Eric won't talk. No. What, what just happened? You're still standing right in there. Is that Eric Lopez? Who is that? He doesn't want to talk. That's Eric Lopez. Oh, shit. He doesn't want to talk at all. Turn me down, turn me yeah, down. Yeah, okay. Yeah, go. let's get the fuck out of here. Oh my God, that was... And then Alessi's there with the side shot. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoa. Okay. We'll talk later, okay. Whoa. We'll go talk. Wow. Wow. Look at him. No, Did no. you get him? He's, Did you get him? He's, Please. He's, he's like, like, get the, the fuck out. Yeah, he probably heard more than everybody else because he had his headphones on and he had the mic. Oh, Right? So God. he was listening and you could see... Like, this is not going well. The sound guy, he's going like... Like he's yeah. putting his head behind the brick wall a little bit, and he's putting his microphone out this way so he's not in the line of fire. Oh Gee knew what the hell was being said, and then he tells us when I get, I'm I'm confused. I was like, shit, you're that? hilarious in that yeah, scene. I was just like, I was confused, and it was so. Let me tell you something, and this is something the camera didn't pick up. I'm standing there, and I'm looking into this guy's eyes. Eric Lopes. Well, I didn't know it was Eric Lopes. I didn't know. What I did know, I'd never seen a face like it in my life. Not because he looked different from other people that I'd seen, but because it looked like a guy that had been exposed to something that has been burdening him for 26 years. It looked like a man who'd witnessed something so deep, so profound, so deeply moving and disturbing and 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 he can't talk and he can't sh how fast did you make that calculation soon as i saw his eyes 
What was it about? Was it like, you know, people describe like the old Vietnam veterans had like the thousand mile <sighs> stare, thousand yard stare. Like they just, they're looking at you, but they're let, not. Let me tell you something. It didn't translate in the, I, I'm looking at it now. I could see in his, his face, the way his face, his whole face and his eyes, like, like if you can imagine a weight on him, a, a weight on his shoulders that's been burdening him for, you know, 25 years, 26 years, uh, something so deep, so profound, so unbelievable, and he's having to take it to the grave. Just imagine, just put yourself in his shoes. I'd yeah. never seen a face quite like it. I, I, I'm telling you the honest God truth. I just remember looking at him. Yeah, going, you're the only one there. I didn't and you know, guys were there. That's and I it. was the closest. I was right across from him, and I was looking up at him. For it kind of spooked me because I didn't know. I didn't see anybody get the door. Like I, well, we, he was in the window. Yeah, he was in the window. But I heard talking, and I was like looking for something in my in my trouser pocket, and I heard talking. And I looked at the front door, and I didn't see anybody at the front door. And I was mm -hmm. like, "Where the hell?" And then I look up, and there he was. And that is when I just there was something about this guy's face, his eyes, like, wow, that was somebody who's been carrying something with him, deeply troubling. But the, the way, from the viewer standpoint, because again, you could see him close, but the camera's kind of far mm -hmm. away. We can barely make him out. Dave was trying to do this, and he was doing this to the cameraman the whole time. The, but and he the, had another. I didn't see he had that. another. Oh yeah, no, he was going like this, like this. I saw. I saw him do one of these yeah, like quickly. Was, but Dave, you're saying he was moving like, oh, a, like Dave, a clock. Dave, almost. Dave said that he'd never had that happen to him in his life before, where someone was looking at him at the cameraman, looking at him going with a with a hand down here like this. Dave was freaking out, man. Like he was never. It's never happened to him before. Because the, and the sound guys like never happened to him before. And I'm somewhat clueless. I'm right across. <laughs> You know, I'm trying to figure out the hell's going on. I want my on. question. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, Pregunta, por favor, please. I wanted to know so badly, like, you know, because I'd heard about this witness for so long, and we had to get the help of the mayor to go out there. It was a big deal. What was the one question going to be? Where you were like, I just want to give a one statement. Question. I wanted him to give me a statement of what happened. Like, like if you, were you driving the car? Were you driving the car? Yeah, during the capture. Because the way his voice, and again, I, I don't but, speak well, here, his language. But here's something that you didn't get right at the beginning of this, okay? Sorry. What's that? Not yeah, your yeah, fault. Please. When we drove up, we just said, Eric. That was all we said. Eric? Eric? And Eric sees us walking up from the window, and he says, if you're here to talk about the ET, he won't talk. Not I. He. So he. Oh, third person. Yeah. He says E.T. We didn't say we were here to talk about the E.T. We never said, all we said is Eric, Eric. And Eric says, if you're here to talk about the E.T., he won't talk. So at what point did they figure out it? It's like the cops showing up at your house at a party, and then the cops, all the cops do is say, good evening, you say there's no drugs in here. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't ask you if there's drugs in here, but now that you mention it, you know what I mean? That was all happening so fast in the clip, though. What did he say? Did did they, was it the translator said, are you Eric Lopes? And he said, I am Eric Lopes. Was well, that, that was happened? later. But right, later, first, but at first he said he. Yeah, he so said he. He, he said, I'm a friend of me. Eric Lopes. He said he'll never talk about the E.T. or something like that. About the E.T. That's what he said. Yes. And then he made a switch to, okay, I'm Eric Lopes. Well, and he said, we're not Eric Lopes. And then I kept persisting. You guys are going to get in trouble. Bullets are going to start flying. You guys are going to get in trouble. I'm going to kick you out with bullets. And then I was, I was like, pregunta, please, por favor, pregunta, you know. And, and I said, you know, will you ever make a statement da, 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 about Eric Lopes? And he says, and you can just tell, he goes, fuck it, I'm Eric Lopes. And that's, yeah. Because, they, I, I, you know, I don't speak Portuguese. I don't know how other people are going to interpret this, yeah. but when I was listening to it, the thing that really struck me is he seemed like his the way his voice sounded seemed so nonchalant. He was like, yeah. eh, no, I remove you with bullets. Like, yeah, yeah. it was not like... I'm gonna remove you with yeah, bullets. Yeah. You know, there was no like, there was none of that. But you can see like, and he's almost like kind of hanging in the window like this. You said you saw his hand like well, this. Well, everybody kind of speculated. I mean, who knows? I mean, you know, but his hand is down below the windowsill mm, like this right. most of the time. And the other, sorry, and the other hand is kind of doing this, and he's pointing at the camera because Dave said he was doing this, and Dave's got the wrong lens on. He's trying to zoom in. It's focusing on the on the wrong thing, and I mean, it almost. That's surreal. Yeah, and, you know, and so here, here's the thing. So you you what, don't you what, don't think though what, you don't what? think that they killed Teresa. You think he died of that infection? I do, and I can tell you why later. Okay. Uh, so another thing 
and, and this is in the in the extras of the movie. We there's another aspect. There was a sighting at the zoo, and we interviewed the veterinarian, the zoologist, the person that ran the zoo. And there were a sighting. There was a sighting by a woman outside. Who, she was in her 80s, smoking a cigarette. We have her on camera, smoking a cigarette, and she saw one of the creatures. This was months later, and all these animals died in the same mysterious way that Marker trees. They were exposed to something that got immune system deficiency, and they all died. We interviewed the guy. It's in the extras on iTunes, Vimeo, not Amazon, but iTunes and Vimeo. Do we if have you, photographic evidence of the animals' carcasses? Uh, no, but I, I interviewed the the, the scientists or the zoologist or the veterinarian who worked on them and he talks about it it's all in the extras Got but anyway it. we didn't include that in the film because it was another aspect of the story that and we're like, gonna oh, release God. that we're yeah put that out uh, there yeah yeah i know so i'm gonna, so, I'm gonna stay on this <laughs> so um uh where was that guys i'm sorry uh we were talking about lopes you had said you're going to answer later my question about your belief that crazy was crazy is it crazy or crazy oh uh well eric lopes all he had to do was come outside and say, God, God, this is so funny. This is a terrible misunderstanding. This is nothing to this story. I wish there was, but it was a not, it was a perfectly normal night, and you know my partner Marco died from what, you know he got an infection. Or I wasn't there. I wasn't there. Whatever, mm. whatever. But he doesn't do that. He could literally just come outside and diffuse the whole thing. Oh my God, this is so funny. Isn't that weird? How rumors spread, and I had nothing to do with any of this, and that would have been the end of it. He gave a statement, and no. But instead, he says, if you're here to talk about the E.T., he won't talk. Yeah. He won't talk, not I. He. That's weird. Yeah. We didn't ask him about the E.T. We just said Eric. We said Eric. Maybe Eric Lopes. That was it. That's all we said. We're looking for Eric Lopes. If you're here to talk about the E.T., that came from his mouth. Yeah. It's weird, right? It's, it's very weird. It's kind of weird. Because then he flips to the... Yeah, then he I'm says, I am Eric Lopes. Yeah. You guys are going to get in trouble. I'm going to kick you out. Bullets are going to start flying. Something like this. So anyway. Are you... Now you've described that stare that, that you saw. Are, are you certain though that that's not it? That that's him? Yeah. And that wasn't the other guy yeah, there who we then found suddenly his, like... So we found like, his... You face, know, fuck it. it is we man. found his Facebook page. And here's another thing that I didn't So he mention. has his picture on there. It's oh, not yeah, like yeah, a yeah. That was him. All right. No question. Got it. So uh, after this incident... Uh, it made headline news across Brazil. Like it got out somehow. I don't this. Know. Yes, this. That we were almost sh shot at or something like this. It made headline news across Brazil. So I reached out through, I think, Marta, because Marta's sister is married to him. Like Eric Trezzi's sister is married to Mar Eric and, Lopes. And then the other sister. And Marta's yeah. the other sister who went on camera to yep. talk about all this. Yep. She's the one that told us to go get Eric Lopes. He's got all the answers. Go get a statement from him. Did she, So she doesn't, it sounds like she doesn't have a relationship with him or, no, or her sister. No, she said that, that the one one or two times that she was desperately trying to give him, tell him the truth, he was just smoking cigarettes, back to back, smoking cigarettes, sweating, smoking cigarettes, and looking at her and smoking cigarettes and just wouldn't say anything. So it tore apart the family. This oh, thing. totally. So anyway, so we get we get a hold of Eric Lopes' wife on the phone or text. I can't remember. One Marco Cherezi's sister. Marco Cherezi's sister. And is it Cherezi or Cherezi? Cherezi. Cherezi. Yeah. Got it. So we get a hold of, of his wife and we said, I said, here's the question I wanted to ask her. I said, I said, what is it going to take for Eric Lopes to come forward and give a statement on what happened. She said, you bring my brother back to life and Eric Lopes will talk. <laughs> uh, I just had David Satter in here who, for the second time, who is to this day actually still, even after almost a year of this Ukraine war, he is the only Western reporter who has ever been banned from post-Soviet Russia by the Russian government. He has been a thorn in their side for 50 years almost. And he was banned in 2013. He's he is viewed as like the preeminent psychologist of Vladimir Putin in the West, in the world. Before the KGB, there was the NKVD in the 30s that was responsible for murdering hundreds of thousands of people. Like the pogroms and stuff. No, no, no. Pogroms were uh, ethnic, uh, anti-Jewish for the most part. Right. Riots. Right. No, this was the Great Terror during the 1930s that Stalin launched against real and imagined opponents in order to bring the country completely to its knees. And 
one of the things he said to me that really does strike me, and I it, he didn't say it, what's the term, carte blanche, or uh, I don't know if it's carte blanche, but he didn't say it like this is always the case 100% of the time. I think he said most of the time, in my experience of 50 some years of journalism, when you get, he was, he had mentioned a quote from a guy named German Ugriamov, I think, from Russia, who had given this insane quote about Putin with the apartment bombings and everything and how he did them. And it was like straight out of a movie. And he said, in my experience as a journalist, when you hear a quote from people or even just a reported quote that someone may have said off camera somewhere else and it's that good and it ties everything together so perfectly not something as simple as it happened like the one you said earlier right. but more like the one you just said that the sister said to you right. eric lopes's wife when you hear a quote like that in his experience he's like people people don't just come up with that it's too mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. And so when I when I, I I can't get that out of my head, I'm like when I hear that, I'm like, she didn't just like think of that, you, you know what I mean? Like that wasn't just like a random whatever. That was rooted in deep emotional ties to a case that took her brother all these years ago. That she's now married to the one man who knows what happened, and perhaps so does she. It's, it's oh, heavy. he must have told his yeah, wife. I mean, had come to, on. Right? Well, well. well so, uh, uh, I, I guess it could I go either reveal, way, I right? I can't reveal this, damn it. I want to, but I can't. I just can't reveal it. But um, uh, Eric Lopes gave testimony at the time, all of it, to someone we know. Okay. So that's all I can leave it right there. Okay. And that person communicated with us. And, 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 and you was, can't say no, I just can't. Okay. All right, I that's can't. fine. Yeah. 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 And, anyway, oh, you know, the 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 um, the other aspect of the story is the transportation of the creature from the military. That's what we're going back to now. So I had said we're skipping over, we're skipping over the radiologist and military X. Very yeah. very quickly though, before we go to that, I just yeah. don't want to forget this. Who were the three random people? that you interviewed in between the crazy the crazy story and the sisters who made you shoot them from behind cuz they were a prominent family, family or yep. something what mm -hmm. did they say they saw again so this was creepy this was so weird because we were in the we didn't even quite figure it out at the time i don't know why we didn't put that together but uh we were in the edit room and like i said earlier I flew a drone over all the different, you know, important sites, the alleged crash site, yeah. the encounter, the capture, the military blockades, all this stuff. And usually when I fly the drone, I'll get a bunch of different shots. I'll, I'll take the drone straight up. I'll look straight down. I'll pan the camera up, down. I, I try to document everything around. So we're, in a, so we're, we're renting a, a nice house on the outskirts of Virginia that's got security um, because we had a lot of camera gear. We had uh, multiple vehicles with camera gear and drones and lenses and all that stuff. And just wanted to be extra careful. And we were also a little concerned because we are poking around on a story that, you know, uh, the government and military didn't want out. And so that was, you know, we're just we rented a nice little gate and had a secure gate going in and out with a security guard. And um, it was a nice place. I and, got you new security, by the way, today. <laughs> I'll talk to you after. All right. So, so... Um, so uh, the owners are doctors, and they have friends, and they were like, well, what are you guys doing here? And we told them we're shooting this documentary on the Virginia case. Oh, you got to talk to her. You got to talk to our friends, their fellow doctors, and they said they're really good witnesses. The entire family had an experience. You got to go talk to them, got to go talk to them. So, so they agreed to meet with us. It was my understanding that they agreed to meet with us on camera, but we got to their house, and the entire family... Are like whoa 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 whoa! What are all these camera gear doing here? It's like well, you said you'd meet with us. Well, we, well, we said we'd meet with you, but we didn't say we'd go on camera. We just wanted you to know what we saw. So I eventually talked him in to get to go on on camera. I was like, look, I'll film you from the back, whatever. They talked. They shared this story for the first time probably in twenty six years, and this was probably oh. Uh, and I found out because of the drone, I was like, wait a minute, this house is like three or four blocks, small box, 
away from where the girls saw this creature, or claimed mm-hmm. to have seen this creature, four or five blocks away from where the alleged capture took place with Marco Trezzi and Eric Lopes, mm-hmm. and just a few blocks away from the military blockade that we have a bunch of eyewitness accounts on people at gunpoint at three o'clock in the afternoon told, you will not be walking through here, yeah. you know? And so I got that all that, and then I, we're at their house, and we're in the edit room months later, a couple months later, and I think it was Boris. He looked, and he's like, you realize, like, wait a minute, this the family, this was like 11 o'clock at night, and they're just a couple blocks away. And the family was adamant that this object, this disc-shaped craft, was looking for something. And I kept saying, what do you mean looking for something? What do you mean? They said it was looking for something. We watched it for 20 minutes, all of them, the mother, the dad, the daughter. And it was doing this grid pattern, looking for something. Boris turns to me and he goes, I think you have a drone shot of of all the areas, of all this area, the military blockade, the girls' encounter, the Marco Trezzi capture, and the house of the people that we're interviewing right now. So we take out the drone footage, we go through all of it. It took us like three or four hours. And we find, we started to identify rooftop and trees that were out front. And we went, oh my God, this house is three blocks away. We have a shot in the film of all that area, yeah. all in one shot. That's This f- could mean one thing. Either this family's full of doggy doo-doo, <laughs> which I can't imagine why they would be, or this was a rescue operation. Mm. That craft was looking to rescue, recover their comrades. Because what the hell else, what the hell else is, are they doing? Because you can hear the testimony of the family. They were looking for something. And I'm like, well, you sure you didn't mistake? And the guy gets upset. He's like, I know damn well what I saw. He's like, I w- we watched it for 20 minutes. It was right above my house, going like this. And it was doing that over that entire a- encounter area. Is the creature, I'm trying to think, because we... We've talked about there's two, could have been up to five, whatever. Yeah. So the creature that the girls saw at this point, that hasn't been captured by the military yet while they're seeing this. Yes. So the fire department made a capture earlier that morning. Which would have been that one. Which would have been, well. No, so, no, because they saw it. The well, so we, so Marco, uh, Marco, my buddy, has met with uh, people that were involved with the first capture, but they didn't want to come forward on camera. Uh, but there was a capture in the morning of a live creature. They got it with a net. And and, and some people say there was another capture that involved gunfire. Um, but we know about the only crazy had, one. Only had two solid, you know, two right. solid, you know, multiple eyewitness, m- all the researchers, like two solid captures. But there are possibly, almost definitely more. But we only include the two. Do we know the... <sighs> I'm, I'm trying to keep it straight. Do we know that that alien that the girl saw was one of the ones that got captured? Almost positive. But that wasn't one of your two you're talking about. Yes, it is. It is one of your two. Mm-hmm, because it was just two blocks away. So Two hours away. When, two the, hours when the family that we're talking about is seeing this but drone. 11 for, o'clock at night. So it's after 3 p.m. Yes. So that one's been captured. Yes. Got it. Okay. Fair yep. enough. So the girls see it at three. It's captured around five thirty or six by Marco Trezzi, which would have been, I guess. Oh, he ca- Oh, fuck! I messed that up. So yeah. he captured that exact one. The one the girls saw, Marco Trezzi captured two blocks Got away. Got it. Okay. Just a couple hours later. Okay. And then okay. And then three blocks away from that, three or four blocks away from that, is the family getting the pizza delivered at eleven o'clock at night. Why are they getting the pizza at eleven? They're getting o'clock food. At night? They're getting food delivered late at night. Who knows? It's summer evening. It was summertime. It's January. Still sketchy. <laughs> I mean, I would get pizza, like, you know, if I'm like out partying and shit, like that makes sense. Yeah. But like a family? Yeah. They got pizza, they got food delivered. And so, hmm. and even the delivery guy, according to the family side. But you have to keep in mind, we found them. They refused to go on camera. They were not looking for notoriety. They didn't want their faces on camera. They didn't want any money. They didn't want, all they wanted for us to know is, hey, oh, I heard that you're doing this thing through the fellow doctors, and they agreed to meet with us to share their story. That was it. I talked him into going on, from the backside, going on camera to talk about what they'd seen. So, But there were also people in the town, town square, who also saw the same craft, 
Same description, also looking for something. That was earlier. How big did they say it was? Not that big. 40 feet in diameter. Okay. Yeah, 40 feet in diameter. Kind of like a decent boat on like the a life, like a life, Like a lifeboat. Yeah. From a bigger boat. Yeah, yeah. Like a little dinghy. Anyway. Interesting. So, okay. So, so now we're, I, are we at the radiologist now? Is that right? Uh, sure. We can do radiologist. That's, yeah. So well, Mark, what do you want to do? Well, let's just go to radiologist. That's, that's fine. So, okay. Ma- so Marco Leal, and I can't emphasize his level of contribution to this project, it would have been impossible without him and the other researchers that had done decades of, of research in the area. And um, there were a couple of students of a, a radiologist that worked at Humanitas Hospital, or was it regional? trying to remember it. Might I'll have look been it up while you're talking. Yeah, okay. I'll see if I can find it. In okay, here. cool. Yeah, I'll definitely talk. definitely show that segment because it's insane. And a couple of his students, he had shared the story with his students years ago, years and years ago. And his students met with, by accident, Marco Leal, who's my uh, co-producer and boots on the ground in Brazil. And Marco found him while he was still employed. He confirmed that, you know, the story and said he'll never come forward publicly. Marco followed him. He disappeared. Then he found him again. Then he would disappear. And this went on for about seven years. Marco Leal is your guy with the mustache. Yeah, the heavy set guy. Yeah, that's, yeah. 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 So Marco finds him years and years and years ago and develops a relationship with him. And finally, after he'd been retired for multiple years, agrees to meet with us to go on camera provided we disguise his voice and don't reveal his face. And he was a radio radiation. He provided photographic evidence of him being at the hospital. We knew he's, you know, we, we knew he's, he was who he said he was. We'd been fault. We've been chasing him down for seven or eight years and his testimony. I don't know why for some reason, but there's something about his story that I found really, really, compelling almost kind of makes your skin crawl um i don't know if you want to play a little yeah i have i have it right here let's pull it up just another day at the office and all of a sudden military jeeps and trucks show up with the armed rifles yeah i'll leave it at that and this guy had his face covered you don't reveal his name yes but this is him on and it's the rate it's the radiologist yeah this is at 10601 i think i started it Regional, regional hospital. Yeah, January it was regional. Okay. 1996. A radiologist has an unexpected visit by the military while on duty at regional hospital. He agrees to share his story, provided his identity remains concealed. We blurred his face in that photograph. Yeah. Outside the gated courtyard, there was a truck from the ESA military. I'm translating what he's saying. In the courtyard, there was a jeep with more military personnel and another eight or 10 police vehicles. Nobody comes and nobody goes. So we have a big military presence on the outside of the hospital. We got two army and two police on the inside of the hospital with a box and something inside of a black zip body bag. Now they're showing the table. They asked me to do the x-rays of the parts they requested. Here's some pictures you have, like redos of the thorax, the abdomen, the pelvis, the legs, the arms, etc., etc. So these are not real pictures. You're doing a recreation. Their eyes were fixed, observing me all the time to see what I was doing, but they didn't say anything. Even among themselves, the x-rays were developed, and at the time, he was saying they didn't say anything even among themselves, and he says, I saw no images. It all was taken by the military that day. Normally, I verify, this is what's interesting, normally I verify the images are correct, but on this day, I didn't verify them. Understand? One person who was there said, your job is done. Thank you very much. Your job is done. Don't comment on what you saw or what you did. What did it smell like? The smell was strong, a mix between sulfur and ammonia. When they took whatever it was in that black bag and they left the hospital and the military and the police with that bag, and that thing. Did the smell leave? 
Despite all the cleaning, disinfecting, the smell remained. And that section of the hospital was closed. We couldn't serve the public because the smell was so strong. All right, I'll cut it there. That is crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he and and there's amazing recreations if people aren't, aren't I get, watching. I get, on, I, get, I get goosebumps on that. Uh, me one. too, yeah. man. I mean, like when and you did a good job with like those artist drawings of like what he's trying to describe. Yeah. But you know, if people are on Spotify and YouTube and didn't see those, you'll see it in the documentary, which you can get on Amazon Prime, Apple TV. You can rent it, buy it, all the yeah. stuff. If you Definitely. buy it, get it from iTunes because you get for the same price, you get two hours of bonus material or Vimeo. I'm an idiot. I bought it on Amazon. All right, I, I buy know. it on iTunes too, but. This, when when you're looking at those recreations, he, I guess he was like taking the images by pressing a button farther away and the military guys were right there and he didn't get to review the images, which he found unique. Cause, never. He never doesn't review them, ever. And he also- the history I think, of his career, he never doesn't get to look and verify the images are correct. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, he was also saying because they were never going to have me verify, why did they have me do it when I'm a guy who actually knows a lot? Why didn't they have any one of the nurses who may not know fucking anything, but they know how to press the button, do it? That was curious to me. And why he was chosen to take the x-rays in general, just overall. Like the whole thing was just, you know, it's, it's another one of those cases where you have, a, it's a little piece of the puzzle. There's no one person that we met with that had the full kind of yeah. you know, overview of the whole case. But when you start to put all those pieces together, you know, the other guy at, at, as a military base that saw something being loaded up on a on a um, navy truck. It was a like a something like a body, like a like a coffin type thing, yeah. hermetically sealed metal box, whatever. You know, you start to put all those aspects together and um and then the secrecy and the people being threatened and the and the military trucks presence in the town of Virginia and local residents being you know at gunpoint told yeah. they can't come through to get to their own house you know and and all of those those things it, it's such a crazy story and i you know I, I look i get that knee jerk reaction of of there's no way this happened I, this is too unbelievable i don't even know i can't even find a, a word in the english language to describe like how you know ex how it's just you can't wrap your mind around it you can't you know if it happened please tell me a story that's more significant than this okay I don't i'm think just there begging you I don't okay think there, I don't, if it happened find out why. yeah and and it's like is this potentially the biggest story? And I don't have all the answers. I want more answers. Yeah. I want military involvement from the United States. That's one of the things that came out while we were there. Coincidentally, and I don't think this had anything to do with us being there, the very control, radar control officer, you know the guys that sit at the airports with the towers and they monitor yeah. all the radar yeah. of objects coming in and out of Brazil and all yeah. that stuff? Well, he was, you know, January 21st or 22nd, he, uh, 1996, he came forward while we were in Brazil. Like, I guess that would have been 2021. The guy right? watching the thing. The guy watching the radar scope. The guy that's with the Brazilian. Hmm. Now, he's also part of military because you're, you know, anything to do yeah. with, I guess. Yeah. And he, you could look. So, um, he says that a plane came in from the United States Air Force, USAF, he calls it, USAF. And uh, he said this plane came in and it didn't have the normal authorization from the Brazilian government to come in. Um, there's a technical word for it. I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of it off the, off, the, off the top of my head. But you have to, you cannot just fly into Brazil without this authorization from the, from the Brazilian authorities. You have to get it. Ov, Oviv or Ovav, something. It's, you can look it up. And um, he, uh, you, you, I got the other guy's testimony here. You should actually take a look at it. He basically says that they came in without British authorization. They were going to come into Sao Paulo, and instead they went to Campinas. Campinas, we have direct testimony. I'll put the Google Earth on the corner of the screen. Or show a scene in the film. You can also do that, too. Campinas is it's Espesex military base, and that is where the university is, all the uh, scientists, uh, prominent 
like doctors, school of education, like there's Espesex military base. It's all the heart of the, of the, the intellectual heavyweights, the, 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 the scientists, the, the, the scholars, the medicine, like it's all out of that region. And the gentleman who is at as a military base, which is the heart of operations during this recovery of this thing, he in said, Virginia. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's outside Virginia. I think it's like like right there. Yeah, it's way. in the it's, yeah. it's in the region. It's in it's in the um, state of Minas Gerais, uh, and uh, the military base. We show clips of the military base from the drone in the sky and blah blah blah. I can't believe that fucking drone didn't get shot down. I know. I, know. I was I was <laughs> like a little right further, a little further, a little further. And I was like I was like this is this might not end well. I was like a little further. Oh god. Okay, turn it abort. You know, come back. I flew my drone over the military base. I wanted to get shots of the military base, but it was really mission sketchy. accomplished. Super. I know mission accomplished. So, um, uh, what was I getting? Oh yeah. So we have testimony from the very man that was at as a military base that picked up the creatures from Humanitas Hospital. The creature or creatures. This is military X. Military X. And he by, says, by the way, you didn't say this. I, I want to make sure I I didn't miss this because mm -hmm. maybe you left this out on purpose, and I can re-edit this and take this out, but. One of the guys that the radiologist witnessed in the room had a camera. Oh, yeah, that was from Military X. Yes. That was from Military X. Yes. He said that. Yes. Okay, all right. Well, let's go to Military X. Yeah. So, cool. so Military X, and we'd been aware of Military X for some time. There were a handful of witnesses from as a military base that were concerned about their safety. They met with a fellow Brazilian researcher. I'm sorry, I'm trying to be very tactful on how I release mm -hmm. this. And they gave on-camera statements in 1996 as a form of protection that if anything happened to them or their families, that w footage would be released. And it's a full, transparent, and I'd seen it. I'd seen the tapes. I'd been in touch with people. And I'm like, oh my God, we can't use, what do you mean we can't use this? People spilling the beans this is all every aspect. No, they, it, was, it was only being released in the 2030. So we'd been known about military acts. It was one of the people that had done this, okay? And uh, we, Marco found him. That's a whole story. It's so incredible. You're Marco, not Marco Therese. Marco, Yeah, Marco Leal, my yeah. fellow co-producer, sorry. And, uh, Marco finds him, the way they finally meet, why are you interested? So the witness, Military X, thinks that Marco Leal is an intelligence officer trying to find out if this guy's talking, trying to see if he's a weak link. And this is like 20 years later. Did Eric Lopes make one of those tapes? Not that I know of. I've seen the tapes. I've seen all of it. So, no. I, I, I mean, I haven't seen Eric Lopes on camera, no. When did they make those 1996. tapes? 1996. Yeah, but like... A week after, um, six months after. I want to say maybe a month or so. There was a press conference. It's in the movie, the press conference, and during that press conference is when those tapes were being made right down the street. Okay, so Tracy's kind Therese's of weird. dead. Tracy's dead. Yeah, but Tracy did not make an on-camera statement uh, like right. that. Right, that's what I'm saying. But he's dead. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So anyway, so uh, we. Uh, uh, you know, we Marco was clearly trying to get military X to come forward. He, military X said, there's all the money in the world. I'm not going to come forward. It's never going to happen. You can just forget about that. But they became kind of friends. And while I was there, I just said, let me, let me go meet this guy. See if he'll just meet with me. Off the record. Just meet with me. And to my surprise, he agrees to meet with me. Marco and I didn't dilly-dally. We got into our car at night. And we drove up into the way hours way north of Virginia and we arrived and boy I could tell you I felt like it was different right we we're kind of in the depths of Brazil at that point I stood out and uh, we got to this place it was like a ro road truck stop bar kind of place and it was at night and um, the bar kind of spilled out into the parking lot like there were chairs that were from the bar that just more so than just the terrace it just spilled out into the parking lot were you guys managing tails while you're down there like are you checking to see if you're being tailed everywhere uh, I, I, I mean i was you know I, I the paranoia started a little bit around this time okay so we show up at this place and people are looking at us i mean i stood i stood out really stood out because you know you don't say. Yeah. And uh, so they, Military X is with another guy, 
younger guy and they jump in the back of our car and they're like let's let's go it's like okay they're like where are we going like it was a little sketchy <laughs> he takes us off six eight nine ten twelve blocks away we go to another restaurant that's outdoors and we sit outside and um uh, the uh the waiter this woman is like uh well what's going on here what are you uh, who are you and what are you doing here who are you with these guys like what's it you know it's like you know, intelligence. Uh, what are you guys talking about? Like, you know, just started asking all these questions, but kind of like jokingly, not yeah. like 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 pleasantly, like lighthearted, but still, she was curious. Like, what the hell are you guys do? This is weird. This is a weird situation. What's going on? You know, kind of thing. And uh, military X jokes with her and goes, "Oh, we're talking about Disneyland." <laughs> we all kind of laughed, and then off she went, and she didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> but we just talked, and I was looking him in the eyes, and I was I, I talked about the importance of. You know, sometimes there are stories that are more important than individuals, you know, and that this is kind of, if this really happened, this story is so much more important than any one of us. This is a big story that could potentially have a, a greater impact on all of humanity and kind of thing, you know? And when you were asking him this and meeting with him, because this is before you interviewed him on camera, obviously, you do... I look him you, in the eyes. You, you you knew full well what his role allegedly Absolutely. was. Absolutely, I'd already okay. seen the game. One hundred percent. There's no doubt about it's it. Zero. Okay. I wouldn't be wasting my time. Almost but zero. meaning there wasn't like when you got him. I what what I really should ask is when you got him on camera. There wasn't really anything surprising uh, about. Oh no, no, there was definitely more levels of detail. Well, okay. So when I watched the tapes of this guy from back in 1996. I had a, it didn't have uh, lower thirds. So Marco, my partner, Leal, would translate as much as he could, as best he could. And obviously what, during the interview, but when I had it professionally translated, mm. like professionally, word for word, mm. everything, and had multiple people go over it, I got a level of detail for that for the first time. That was pretty remarkable. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. But in any case, at the dinner, I, I you know, I, I've done this a, a number of times before. I did it in Australia with... with um, the sixty six sighting, yeah, the sixty six sighting in Westall with the with the uh, with the teacher, Mister uh, Gr Greenwald, or yeah, the teacher, yeah, Greenwood, yeah. Green, it was Greenwood, yeah, I did it with him where I I look I look people in the eyes and I look into their soul, and like I you know I want, like I I I, I just explain the the significant the potential significance of their story and that it's it matters more than us like, and if everybody. You know, had, if everybody stuck to that level of secrecy, like, it's just not fair. Like, it's this is something that we're all entitled to kind yeah. of thing. In a nice way, I get the fear factor and all that. And um, I think he enjoyed meeting me. I certainly enjoyed meeting him. What did and you I, see when you looked in his eyes? Oh, Because you talked in detail a, about these other guys. Beautiful, beautiful human being. Like, he was so kind, soft-spoken, measured, he had a character that was just soft and pleasant and jovial and just light. It just a just seemed like a really beautiful human being. Really, mm. I really mean that. But I didn't talk to him a whole lot about the specifics. I didn't say, "Tell me what you saw." <laughs> like, what exactly? What did you? You know, I didn't get into that because I wasn't going to push his comfort zone. We were just getting to know each other a little bit. Told him what I've been up to for the last, you know, twenty whatever years, that kind of thing. We just had a really nice meeting. And then we left, and we didn't say, you know, meet with us, go on, none of that. But we kind of continued communication, Marco and I, and then, for whatever reason, he's getting separated from his wife or something, there's, there's go, something going on, there's a very small window where he's suddenly considering meeting with us and giving a story. And it's, mm. I, I don't remember exactly what day it was. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, um... I'm going to say it was, let's just say it was a Sunday, okay? I could be off. I don't remember. But it was a couple of days after we'd met with him, and he's suddenly thinking that maybe, just maybe, he might meet with us and do an on-camera thing like on a Wednesday or two. He's just, he's flirting with the idea. So I see an opening, and Marco's going back and forth. We want it. We want his testimony so badly. The guy who potentially drove this thing around at the military base. I've seen all the photographs of him at the base. I mean, the, the guy is exactly who he says he is. Mm -hmm. I see an opening. And I know in the past that when there's an opening, you don't let it shut. 
and you don't let them sleep on it. You act now. Because if they're in the moment, if you let them think too much, like if he had gone to sleep that night, guess what? You know, he would have like gone, what am I thinking? Like, no, absolutely. I, gar I guarantee you that would have happened. He was oscillating. He was right on the fence. He was doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, I, so our like, meeting was fairly fresh. So I said, you tell him we're coming right now. And he's like, well, I don't, you know, I really know where he's going to meet. I don't know if we can do it here. I, you know, I don't want to be seen with this. And I said, we're on our way. I'm taking a chance. Load up the cars, rock and roll, baby. Let's go. And we're driving. It's like a four, three or four hour drive to the north. And, um, you know, he was texting with Marco. They were on app signal or something. I don't remember what signal they were. They were on something. And um, they were kind of going back and forth. And it was like, oh, we can meet here. We had no meeting place. Oh, I don't know. It was like this. Or we're on our way. Finally, his biggest fear, we had one building that we could have met at, but it didn't have any power. We needed power. We needed light. So he's like, can't be there. You damn straight ain't coming to my house. Like, that's not going to happen, you know. And uh, I can't be seen in public with you. I can't, you know, none of these things. He was so paranoid. So I was like, well, let's get a hotel room. And we'll rent the hotel room. We'll we'll sneak all of our gear to the best of our ability into the hotel room. And then he just shows up at the hotel room, walks in the lobby, and up he goes to our room. He's never, we're never seen together. We're in a hotel room of our choice. We know it's not bugged. We know it's not, you know, there's no way because we picked this hotel. So he seems to take to that. And we have a certain period of time when we, that's, that's how we did it. We went to the hotel room and we set up very last minute and uh, got him in the room. And I was, my biggest fear was, let's just say that we arrived and Alessi was there with us too. Poor Alessi had to stay in the parking lot down and, <laughs> he didn't get to see any of it, but uh, but my biggest fear was is that military X would arrive and we're still unloading camera gear and tripods out of the damn car in the parking mm. lot, and he would just like uh, that's it, I'm out of here. I told these guys I wouldn't, you know what I mean. So you had so this little teeny room. We had a tiny little room and we had a narrow window like this, and it was so precarious at any moment this guy was going to get cold feet and leave. But we did it, and you had it from the back with his voice changed. That completely. was it. That was the only option, and it was. What what did he say? He said it's, uh, his, the day started out like normal, every day at the base. And then he said that he got a call. He, got, he was summoned. That's the word that he used. He was summoned in that he was going to go on a mission. It was a secret mission. He was with some other fellow guys from S2, S, S2 which is military intelligence. And then he was going to be driving a truck, and he was going to be following another vehicle. It was a combi, which is a, a Volkswagen bus. And he was following uh, this bus. They arrive at one downtown Virginia. Then they get to uh, either one hospital, then they go to another. They go to the backside of Humanitas Hospital, and they pull their trucks up to the backside of Humanitas Hospital, and they get out, and they go inside, and there's like a military presence, doctors, people with clipboards, and there's a creature on the table inside of a body like a box and he sees like he sees the knee down he sees like he sees everybody looking at it and he walks in and i don't think that he was supposed to see it he walks in not really knowing what the hell's going on and he sees this creature like from like like a little above the kneecap down in a box with sees his the brown, toes sticking out right he sees the leg part of the leg brown skin oily greasy just like everybody talked he sees this V-shaped foot in the cask. He sees the look on everyone's faces, how freaked out they are. And uh, he said he got in and he felt like over his head he was really like, holy shit, what am I looking at? Uh, yeah, can you find it? I'm trying to find it right now because you guys had the, what was really compelling is you had the image on there where it shows the creature like in the box. Yeah. I just don't, I want to, I don't want to show a ton of this testimony. Yeah, 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 it, there we go. Uh, yeah, back it up from right there. From right, like here? Yeah, yeah. That, All right, yeah. let's go. Because I, I said to him, put me in that room. That's what I always tell people. It's I want to be in that room. such a good question, man. Yeah. I love that. All yeah. right, so this is 1655. I felt a climate of tension. I'm translating again. A climate of tension. Everyone looked at everyone else, wondering what was going on. That's the truth. What caught my attention, which I forgot to say, was the foot. 
It was like this. This is what I asked you about earlier with the third nub. Practically two fingers, but he's holding that thumb out like it's three. When you looked and you saw the, the, the leg or part of the leg. Is this where the graphic the foot, comes in? The, with the V, right? What did he think? What got my attention, what led me to believe that it wasn't a human being was the foot. And, he's, and you're showing his hand again, close. Everybody was shocked. Very shocked. I looked at it, then looked away because I got scared. What is that? When I looked, my expression changed. I was in over my head with the situation. They did this, like, get out. The soldier, I think it was, a soldier from the fire department. Leave, leave, leave. So I took a step back and turned around. But before I left, I remember to the right of the box, there was a soldier with a camera. There it is. That's the shot. But he wasn't filming. He had it hanging here. He's pointing to his shoulder. He had it hanging here. And then this is the shot you got of Aza military base. Roll it just a second longer because I ask him about photographic evidence right here. According to witnesses, the army operations originated from here. Can't believe they didn't shoot this drone out. This drone Unbelievable. Is there filmed footage, video footage of the creature that he knows about? He asked if there is any copy, because Marco's translating right now, that was shot at the hospital that was brought to your attention. And now he's going to answer, yes. They have it for sure. For sure. Military X says that on January... All right, we'll stop it there. Yeah. So this was, this is the central thing, and I jumped the gun on this earlier a little bit, but that means that there is, that this guy is claiming that they took a video of this and they have it. And where I'll disagree is it doesn't, I don't know that it necessarily means, and I don't have the benefit of the research you've done here, so you can fill me in, but I don't know if it necessarily means that those guys would still have it, but what it, what it does mean is that if that guy had a fucking camera and the body, of course they took a video. So oh, there's a video 100%. that exists. He's 100%. right about that. So let me, let me, let me, uh, let's see, how can I say this? I have spoken with three, four, I've spoken with personally four people that have seen photographic evidence of the creature. Foot, like a still frame or the video? Uh, both. Both. Uh, Who are these people? Are, well, I can to talk say. to I can talk about two of them. Oh, that's good enough. So, uh, and the reason why I can talk about the two of them is because the New York Post uh, did some probing and I helped them. And I, I neglected to say earlier I said that Uba Dajara, one of the leading researchers, has completely done it when he won't talk to anybody anymore. And then I said that the other guy, Claudio Covo, also a leading researcher on the case, he's dead. And there was another guy named Peccaccini, and he vanished, gone, for like since 2004 or five. Nobody could reach the guy. And when this film was about to come out, Peccaccini resurfaced. Excuse me. And Peccaccini, again, was one of the leading researchers. Peccaccini was involved in more research on this case than probably, I mean, right there with, with, with Uber Jara and maybe more. Peccaccini revealed for the first time ever that he was shown footage. He's got the name of the person. He knows where it was. 35 seconds of footage of the creature. It was alive. And he gave those details. But it was dead by the time Military X saw it. No, could, it could have been another one. We don't know. Okay. Yeah, well, that one was alive. And he doesn't know where it was. He said it wasn't in a... And he said it wasn't... The, the footage shows a creature that was feeble. It was like, like... I think he said it was sitting down. Or maybe there are two uh, officers holding it, but it was feeble. He, it looks like it was dying. And he said that it was a shot on uh, video, and it was 35 seconds long, and the, uh, they had uh, protective gear on, they had masks, they had gloves, and they were one soldier here, one soldier here holding the creature up, but it was weak and feeble. And it was like a child size. Yeah, smaller, like four and a half feet or something like that. And they are holding it up, but it was feeble. This is according to Peccaccini. And that uh, they were trying to give it water, and it, but it wouldn't drink. And they were trying to give it um, 
fruit and it wouldn't it wouldn't eat that either but he said it looked like it was dying it was not it didn't look but it was exact description of what the girls had seen then there was another woman uh that we that we found so we we located a photograph um we were on on our way to this person's house and uh at the last minute he got cold feet and wouldn't even meet with us and said he was concerned about his own security and this was like probably the third or fourth day when we got there on this last month long trip but a friend of his was shown the photograph two friends of his one of them just died and the other one was a woman and that woman gave us detailed description of what that photograph said and it was two beans one alive and she said the other one looked like dead and it had um fire department and military police in the background a couple people and uh and i said well how do you know one was dead she said it was on its lying on the ground or something and the other one was either standing or being held or something but you could clearly see that one of them was alive so that account went in the, went into the new york post in an article i think about a month and a half ago and um and then but this guy had to drive it out right so after this happens the military guy has to put it in his truck and wait for yes. the blackhawks you talked about right yeah so the us so uh so he uh they leave humanitas hospital and they go to Ezra military base for the night. And the creature is in the back of the truck. And is it just military X in the car or does he have a partner? Uh, there's a, there's a, a small convoy. And But the creature's in his... I believe that he was driving the truck alone, but there was a convoy. There were other trucks. But he but the creature's in his truck. The creature was in his truck. And he's correct. told to go park it like against park the wall? Park it in Ezra, back it up against the wall in Ezra. And wait. And wait for the night, yes. And now cue back to the to the person reviewing like the air traffic you were talking about well this comes after so i'll tell you okay. that in a second okay. so so he spends the night as a military base and then from as a military base he takes it to um uh it's it's campinas espesex military base in campinas um unicomp it's a whole we, we show a map in the film so while this is all going on because this is kind of the first time that we got testimony from an alleged uh, you know, military officer that was at Ezra that transported this thing around. So we we get um, very credible testimony that th this thing ended up at, at, at Campinas. I said at the time on camera to Military X, then what happened? So you drop this thing off at Campinas. What happened? What happened after that? And he says, I can't say for sure because I wasn't there, but the rumors on the base were that the Americans came in. So I got that that seed planted from military acts pretty early on. In fact, every other military and civilian witness that I spoke to, I always asked, like, where did it go? If this happened, where did it go? And they all said Americans got involved. They all told me that. While we were in Brazil, the radar control officer who was on duty, and I can't remember the date, it was either January 21st or January 22nd, uh, right around this time, 1996, saw, uh, he said, USAF, that's the United States Air Force, USAF flight come in, and it was, um, didn't have authorization from the Brazilian government, and it landed in Campinas. And, and then two helicopters went from Campinas to Virginia, okay? And then from Virginia back to Campinas. And, and then at the, this point, though, you said the truck is at Campinas. Uh, the truck was at it was at Campinas. Okay. And then the United States Air Force something was loaded onto that plane, and then it flew back to the states, and that's it. And it, and that's all we know. How do we know that the tapes weren't loaded on? Well, you said you have four people who have seen it, which means they would have seen got, it after this. So so yeah. I will I will I will um, let's see how much more I can reveal without jeopardizing my efforts. Let's put it this way: um, the creature spent time at regional and humanitas hospital there are people there with resources got it yeah okay so but um, you also didn't say in the documentary but you were just telling us earlier today off camera right when you finished it sounded like with like military x and you were like done these interviews with the with the daughters and everybody like soza all these people got visited one oh, yeah. by so, one by Essa. So, so this all took place over. It was the last sort of week of production. Doors were really opening, like things were really happening. The mayor was getting involved. We tracked down Eric Lopes. We met with Military X. Military X was considering opening a few other doors for us. Things were happening. 
It was very exciting, but it was also a little spooky. Like I felt, we all kind of felt like on edge, especially after the death threat. You had death threat. Well, the, the threat of, of violence from from Eric Lope. Oh, right, right. That right, we're right, on it. Right, we're right. on his radar now. Yeah. He was probably ticked off. Now he's probably notifying the military. Who knows? Like you know, they found me. They're trying to get a statement out of me. They're probing me. They're coming on my property. Did you have a plan to be able to get multiple copies of your film out of there? Yeah, I did. Yes, I did. I did that. Yes. After okay. Eric Lopes, I went straight to FedEx, copied all that data, everything, that, every interview that I'd done to date, and, and FedExed it off to uh, America. You weren't worried that it was going to get intercepted I at was, FedEx? Of course I was. But I was the best but, I could but do. But then you saw it made it. Yes, it did. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I was, I was worried about all the above. I was super paranoid. Are you kidding? Yeah. So then there were some doors opening for military acts that, it was pretty intense. Like, I mean, if we had like, well, if the one thing I'm about to tell you didn't happen and we had another couple of weeks, I'm, I mean, I'm fairly confident that we might have gotten our hands on some more evidence, certainly testimony, probably evidence too. But in any case, remember, uh, it's weird. So... People that we had either just met with or that we were about to meet with suddenly got phone calls from as a military base. And the who, who called them? Military base. But yeah, but like, was it just like some sergeant at the front desk or was it? Military base. That's all I know. Got it. Okay. Yeah, it was as a military base. Whoever, I don't know. Um, I didn't get this, that more details than the military base calling. And they said to Military X, um, hey, this is whatever. Um, you, you're still living over at uh, this address? Oh, good, good, yeah. How's the family doing? Mm. Yeah, you guys doing well? Oh, good, yeah. good, yeah. Hey, uh, there's a American uh, f documentary film crew <laughs> that are uh, poking around. Um, you didn't by chance meet with them, or did they contact you? Yeah, dude, they did that. And, and now then, he's on camera. They can tell the back of his head, I assume. Yeah, and then the people that we were about to meet with, they got summoned into the base. And this time, they got summoned into the base. Are you allowed to say who they are? No, no. I don't okay. no, no. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. And so they got summoned into the base. So we were told at that point, you know, get the hell out of it. Like, you guys just don't come near us. Stay clear. Like, the situation is super hot right now. They're all over us. They know about you. They know you're poking around. Like, if I were you, I'd get the hell out of here. And so we did. We did. Wow. And, and uh, that's when I FedExed, right around that time, I FedExed the tapes back. But we were, look, I, here's, here's my uh, best determination of the level of danger we may or may not have been in. And, what, and this is that. This is that the... Their own men, their own people in the military were threatened. We know that for a fact because every one of them told us that. Even the people that did the x-rays don't talk about this. The consequences of, of sharing this story will be severe, is what they said. No one, as far as I know, not one of the witnesses said, we will kill you. They just said the consequences for violating this, you're taking this to the grave, will be very severe. Uh, jail death, whatever, family, you know, just these people were terrified, and they were terrified 26 years later. Now, now you got a gringo camera crew poking around. I'm not even, you know, poking around, like, think about, like, if they're going to threaten their own people that were involved, that worked for them, what on earth would they do to us? So I just got super spooked, you know, and... um we got the hell out. And, you know, I want to go back and I will go back because I can't, I can't walk away from how close we've gotten, but I'm just trying to figure out when that's going to be. I've got an eight year old son. If I didn't have an eight year old son and I wasn't in a relationship with a beautiful woman and the mother of my child, um, it would be a lot easier decision for me, but I got to think about, I have a son, you know? Yeah. There's and a lot on the line. yeah, I got a lot on the line, and 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 and, uh, and so I got to think about my security and weigh the pros and cons. I mean, this has been a lifelong effort for mine, and I'm suddenly within striking range of potentially the biggest piece of evidence in the history of the phenomenon. 
I'm getting so close to it. I'm talking to people that know where it is and have seen it. Do you know what that feels like for me? I can't imagine. Yeah. It's like you could see it. You could see something you've been going after for 30 years, and there it is. It's right there. Do you think it's, you're going to get your hands on that video? I'd say 50-50. Will it be released in my lifetime? 100%. 100%. Yeah, I feel about 100%. 99.9. Do you think you'll meet an alien before you die? Would love to. <laughs> That's a hedge of an answer. <laughs> That's just a hope. I didn't get a percentage there. <laughs> yeah, you know, one thing that I've learned, never say never. Never have that knee-jerk response that we all have, myself included, multiple times I've proven myself wrong, where I just think, this is impossible, this didn't happen because it can't happen, it mm. couldn't have happened. And you have that, and myself, I'm guilty of it myself, and I'm researching this stuff, and I get it. I just say, like, never say never, and suspend judgment just long enough to at least consider the possibility if this story did happen it's undoubtedly the most significant event in modern history i can't think of a bigger story so it merits further investigation okay. it merits further attention um i'm hoping that this is just, this is just going to trigger a landslide of stuff. I know there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes, which I'm, I'm helping out with discussions. There's a huge dollar amount, um, that we put reward for the footage. We've even said we'd make a massive donation to the children of Virginia for schools and education and medicine, um, that I put on the table. So if you're not concerned about yourself, if you feel like you've got enough resources, you're not willing to risk, you can do it anonymously. You can do it publicly. You can do it however you want it. And we would make a significant donation to the city of Virginia for the children. And that's gotten people to consider it. And we'll see what happens. One, one of the things I remember from the documentary that I believe it was like the men in black said to maybe it was the mother of the daughters. I might be getting some people mixed up here, though. Yeah. Was a warning they were given was something along the lines of if this news got out, the population would collapse. Yeah. So okay. So this is yeah, that's pretty cool. So the mother of the deceased military officer, police officer Marco Trezzi's mother, she got a visit mm. from the military, and they said to her, "It's true what happened, but if this story gets out, society would collapse." Why society, why as you know, that? it would collapse. Why do you think they said that? Because that's going to lead into a main question I have. For well, you. you remember when the girls saw the creature, they were Catholic, and they thought it was the devil, and it was bringing in everything into question, and they were terrified. Is there an element of religion that they're concerned with? Is it going to make everyone reconsider the origins of man or the big... I don't know. Or Look, are they going to come here, has, kill people? Yeah, have have... Has my uh, has my life changed from what I've learned in the years, the thirty years that I've been doing this? Uh, it has, in the sense that it's expanded my my view of reality, my view of the universe, my view of where we might fit within that um, that. Uh, with our place in the universe that we're just one part of, of a yeah. much more intricate complex life system out there i wonder like is it interdimensional is it time travel is it creatures that live underground is it interdimensional interplanetary is it you know is it all of the above maybe it is I honestly, after all these years and all the military men and the scientific community that I've talked to, both on and off the record, I don't think anyone truly knows has all the answers. In fact, I'm certain of it, that they don't have all the answers. And I, I remind, sure, I agree. remind your audience, people always say, why on earth would any government, governing body, not come forward and share what potentially could be one of the biggest revelations of modern time, something that could unite the entire race, 
the entire planet. And that is, we're not alone. And I had a military guy tell me, he was almost laughing at me when I brought this up. U.S. military guy? Yes. And he goes, yeah, 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 mm, yeah, yeah. I said, wow, this would be the biggest story of mankind. We're not alone. This would be great. It's amazing. He goes, yeah, you're looking at it all wrong, kid. I'm like, well, what, how am I supposed to look at it? He goes, look at it this way. This is from our perspective. We are paid to protect you. Mm. We are paid to control the airspace. There are objects clearly under intelligent control flying around in sensitive airspace, flying rings around our fastest jets. Shall they show up to be hostile? Not saying they are, but if they were, we have no visible means of defense against them. We don't know who they are, where they come from, or what they want. Right, so they don't want the cat out. This is how I've been reading it. They don't want the cat out of the bag because they don't want to spook whatever is out there. Because you're going to, well, you're going to reveal what you know and at the same time, you're going to reveal all the things you don't know and your vulnerabilities. Mm. And that's the problem. And that's the way it was explained to me. And that actually, excuse me, that makes sense. It makes sense to me. I don't agree with it, but it makes sense. That line of like what secrets are too big that people can't know and there's other human beings who get to decide that those people can't know is a very scary, scary, very not black and white line. And I fall on both sides of the issue at given moments on all a lot of the big key issues and this is no different but you look at aliens and it's like my my first inclination is half the reason is because they're already here like i look at people around there i look at like a xi jinping i look i look at a donald <laughs> trump i look at i look at an elon musk it doesn't have to be bad right yeah. like and, and i'm like that might be an alien <laughs> steve jobs steve jobs might be an alien Steve Jobs could have been an alien. Or Steve maybe, Jobs was adopted. Or maybe we all are. We're, maybe we're we an all alien. Are. We're an alien to somebody. Maybe it's well, we are. That's right. <laughs> but like to our own planet, like maybe it's a simulation. I I don't know what the fuck it is. But you know, you look at art over time, and and you look at let's just say like keep it simple, the last century, and you see these drawings because like I've never looked into. I, I should do this deep dive. I've never looked into like 16th century, 17th century, 18th century like artist renditions of like an alien or something or how much there was. So I'll do that later. But you look at like the 20th century and into the 21st century, whether it started with drawings and whatever and, and moved towards movies where they make something look a certain way. And we all, when someone says alien, we all picture a very similar thing and it's very similar to what these people saw. And so I always look at this and I go, art imitates life and it imitates a knowledge of something. So uh, along the rabbit holes, that, or not the rabbit holes, but along the deep web ties mm. to the people who make these movies, all the way up to the comedies like Men in Black to movies like Alien, which is, that one was a little different. Or, you know, E.T., that's a good example. Let, let me give you an example of something. I know exactly what you're getting at here. Yeah. So if you take Close Encounters of the Third Kind that was made in 1977. Yeah by um, none other than Steven Spielberg. Mm -hmm. Steven Spielberg has features the creatures and all that stuff. So all those reports, including Richard Dreyfuss's face being burned, came directly out of Project Blue Book files, the Air Force's own files. Steven Spielberg had a cameo appearance of Dr. Jalen Hynek, who investigated UFO reports in an official capacity for the United States Air Force. And those close encounters of the third kind that we talked about earlier, yeah. that's when the witnesses, you know, claim to see occupants, beings associated with the craft. Those depictions from the witnesses were taken out of the files and right into the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And there you go. That's it. So they got all that information, flight characteristics, what the UFOs look like, what the beings look like out of Project Blue Book Files. <laughs> <laughs> it's absurd. It definitely... And Heineck has a cameo appearance. Most people don't know that. There's Heineck smoking a cigar during the... Yeah, that's Heineck. There, there, is, there is an interesting tie there, and, I'm, and I'm, I just... I have believed that myself over the past year and a half or two years. Like, I told you, Alessi got me really into this like a year ago. But, like, as an outside, just kind of like... 
you know, sitting back and letting out a deep breath, like, Jesus Christ, I can't believe everything that's going on out there. And thinking, like, I've had that thought of, like, you know what? They might be a fucking alien. Or that person might be an alien. Like, they're probably not from this planet. And when you think about all the conspiracies, many of which are wild, and, and then detract from ones that actually are real. Fact is stranger than fiction. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I get, so, like, I sit up at night sometimes, not even, like, when I'm baked. And I just, like, think about this. And I'm like... What, what if that's the what if that's part of the meaning here you know you know uh by the way if i if i this is the longest podcast i've ever done in my life well including the what's going to yeah. be the first podcast uh, unbelievable we've been i hope for... i don't look i hope i don't look i'm you know am i, am I okay still after no nah, you're doing great <laughs> this happens this has happened I, now i had a little extra coffee <laughs> <laughs> this has happened I now needed my little coffee break <laughs> five times before where alex horowitz early on jim diorio one time for 73 74 tim mcbride for 105 106 and then another one i just recorded that i'm holding where you know people are going and i'm not going to stop them so i just make oh, it two podcasts it's, you know what's so nice about it is that I realize, as someone who's researched this for all these years, I don't like daily think about all these different, you know, they're just swirling around in my head. But when I came on with you, I suddenly felt this river of information just flowing through me. That's good. And realizing, like, my God, it's so great to be able to get some of this out because there's so many. When you make a movie, you shoot. Hundreds and hundreds of hours, yeah. hundreds of that hours. That we're all going to see now. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and a lot of that material ends up on the cutting room floor, not because it's not good. You have two hours. You simply can't yeah. squeeze it all in. You know, yep. I did a Senator Harry Reid. Do you know how much bonus material Senator Harry Reid? That's I'm the only person that got Senator Harry Reid on camera before his cancer diagnosis. Jeez. So he's walking. He's doing well. He's totally normal. And he, within weeks of that, he got, he went into like, you know, he had pancreatic cancer and he went into treatment. He was weak. He was in a wheelchair. He couldn't he speak was, very well. He was old, but that was does old, make you but, think. But he was healthy. That he was makes perfectly you think. Fine. I don't yeah. know. I don't oh, know about come that on. <laughs> Please. Suddenly like, oh, Harry, you talked, buddy. Hate oh, to see yeah. you go. You know, and you know what? Harry had no intention of this program ever to be re re revealed. Did, I mean, he signed something to talk with you, obviously, right? Well, no, yeah, but it was on the front page of the New York Times. It was exposed well, what well, he started. Look, he kept it secret. Like I said earlier, he kept it secret through the tail end of the Bush administration, all the way through the Obama administration. What year again did you talk with him? In, in uh, 2017 or 18? Ooh, 18 or 19. Like right 18. before he retired. Uh, he had just retired. Months, months later. Right, okay. Yeah, just retired. And then you killed him. Um, no, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I but, have tremendous respect the fact that the former Senate Majority Leader, I mean, that's a big decision to make. Well, I just, You've got this whole like career spanning decades, and you're going to go out with talking about UFOs. I mean, that was kind of a risky move. He was, he was so like... He said, matter oh, of fact about th this it. This is what I'll never forget. And you, by the way, you didn't tell in the first podcast we got off it, you didn't tell the story about how the interview almost didn't happen. Oh. So say this and then tell that story. Okay. That's great. So you say what? Say the thing you were just going to say. I oh. don't want to stop you. Oh, but. oh, I got it. Now, <laughs> let, me tell, let me tell you the Senator Harry Reid thing first. Because, okay. All right. you know, in, in a career of mine with I've got 50 years of denial, which I sold to Discovery Channel, no comment. Then I did Out of the Blue 1, Out of the Blue 2. Then I did I Know What I Saw. Then I did the phenomenon, and suddenly I'm doing the phenomenon, and suddenly I've got the opportunity to interview a household name, someone who's never gone on the record talking about UFOs in the past, former Senate Majority Leader, one of the most powerful men in America. And it's like, and I wasn't talking to my partner Rebecca about it. I wasn't talking to my friends about it. It was all brewing behind the scenes. I didn't want to jinx it. It was like, you know, it's going to happen. Because, you know, sometimes... Someone will get cold feet, or for whatever reason, they'll just be like, you know what? I thought about it. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. So don't talk about it. Just go get it done. So I w months of of back and forth, uh, at least maybe two months of back and forth, three months of back and forth, uh, maybe longer. Right around that period of time, George Knapp is being incredibly uh, mandatory. Like I couldn't have done it without him ever. And um, then he agrees to do it. We get all the camera crew to Las Vegas, 
and we're going to meet in in the um, U, is it you uh, Las Vegas University, so L A U or something or L A anyway. Uh, we meet at his office, and then there's a, a, a like a like a library. UNLV. Yeah, it would have been Nevada, University Las Vegas. Of, probably yeah, okay, uh, University of Las Vegas. And uh, we meet at that instead of because he also had an office in the Bellagio, and they didn't want to do it there. Of course he did. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> uh, and uh, he, uh, it's all happening. I'm in touch with his uh, assistant. I think was, her name was Kate, and um, going back and forth. Everything's going great. Here's the directions. We're going to do it tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, whatever. He's going to have 55 minutes and going to show up here. We'll let you guys in a little early so you can get set up. Here's the directions. Well, that night, my uh, wonderful d uh, director of photography, David West, uh, his son, I guess, was bullied at school. And uh, and his wife called, and he was all distraught. And I guess it, he got hit, and he went to the hospital for like whatever little scratch or cut, or had to get some stitches. And he was distraught, rightfully so. And he was up all night. And I guess the next morning, Dave was going to leave early, and he was going to get set up because there's a lot setting up all the lights and getting the whole. You know, we wanted to get plenty of time to do all that. Got the sound guy coming, lighting, and really, you know, it's my biggest interview of my life, my whole career. Uh, we got the camera set up. I even went as far as like the backdrop, which was a library and I was putting the books in the right order and color coordinating them. And like at all, I spent like a half an hour, 45 minutes just getting the books looking great, you know, and rechecking. Danny Jones would be proud of you for that. <laughs> and rechecking this thing, you know, getting everything set up and we're minutes away. I get a text from the very man, George Knapp, who, uh, set this whole thing up who's instrumental in setting this whole thing up. And he says, call me immediately, like fucking right now. I was like, oh my God, Jesus. <laughs> like looked at him like, God, what, what happened? I do? <laughs> so of course I call him immediately and he goes, he goes, this interview is about to be terminated. I was like, what? this is so left field. What do you, what do you, what for what? We're here. Yeah. And he says, Someone on your crew is being a complete, like, beep, beep, wad. You can say what you want. Yeah, I know, but I don't want to reveal what he said because right. it's his words. But he was, like, you know, very explicit, and he was very upset. Someone on your team is being a is, – is there someone drunk <laughs> on your – like, do you have a drunk person <laughs> who's verbally abusing his assistant, Kate? <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, I – they're about to walk away. This interview is about to be terminated. You're, you're seconds away from being terminated. Oh, my God. My heart sank. I'm looking around the room, and I'm seeing, like, the audio guy. There's uh, another assistant that we had, and there's an audio guy that I just met. <laughs> I'm like, God, I don't even know him. Uh, he's, he looks so nice. Like, What's your problem, motherfucker? Yeah, I'm looking at him. <laughs> I'm looking at everybody. I'm like, look. At, and I look over, and I see Dave. The, the director of photography, and I see him, and I look at him across the room, and I looked at him, and he looks at, back at me, and he's like, he's setting up a tripod or something. He's like, like, like what? <laughs> and I just looked at him, and I was like, that's the weak link. That must have been Dave. <laughs> he was up all night, whatever. He goes, I suggest you do some damage control, and you do it now. He said that to you? George Knapp said that to me. Oh, oh, George I suggest said that you do you. some damage. I'm on the phone with George Knapp as I'm scanning the room. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Who is this here? So I'm looking around and I was like, it, it must be Dave. And Dave's, like I said, Dave's like, look at me like, you know, what? Like, you know, I was like, we'll talk later. <laughs> he goes, I suggest you do damage control. That's what George Knapp says. He goes, and I would do it now. So I call Kate, you know, the right hand person of, of Senator Harry Reid. I call her up and she's like, oh, hello. And she's like, um, is there somebody like drinking or something on your <laughs> crew? And I said, my God, absolutely not. I, it's a long story. This kid got beat up. Please yeah, show up now. I, I said, <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. Like what happened? She's like, I've been working for Senator Reed for over 10 years. I've, I've never had anybody be so rude to me and like, and just cranky <laughs> and cantanker. It just... It was funny. It's You're like, I, I thought maybe were you guys out drinking all night? I, I was like, absolutely not, Kate. I said, I'm so sorry. I said, Dave's son was uh, was 
bullied at school. He got punched. He was hospitalized. He had to get stitches. Dave was fretting all night. He was up early to get set up. I guess he must have been flustered. Maybe perhaps he couldn't find the address. He called you and vented. I'm so sorry. This is unlike him. I've been working with him for 10 years. He's a polished professional under any other circumstances. Like, I, I can't emphasize the level of apology. I, I'm, it's never happening. You know. And she said, okay, okay. Well, I really appreciate you explaining that because, you know, I thought maybe he was drunk or, you know, he was really angry. You know. And I'm just looking at Dave. It's like, I can't believe you almost blew this whole, <laughs> like, you know. And Dave, I'm sorry if you watch this and you're upset that I'm exposing this, but it is a pretty <laughs> funny story. All, all's well that ends well. Everybody understands. Yeah, it's, but it was like, bets are off. it was, you, you know, and that's the thing is, it's like, it's never a done deal until it's done deal. I've showed right. up with other witnesses to do interviews and they got cold feet when I arrived. I had a whole interview set up, excuse me, with Buzz Aldrin, uh, landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong, Apollo mm -hmm. 11. His sister, Faye Ann Potter, and I were friends. He, she revealed his encounters with UFOs, yada, yada, yada. Got to France. I mean, I borrowed money because I was going to interview... Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin. Yeah. Get there. I, like, I fly to France. I borrowed money, got a camera code. I get all the way there, and he pulls the carpet out from underneath me. Like, I keep waiting day after day after day. So I've learned yeah. in the past. You think, you know... It's believe me when I tell you it ain't a done deal till it's a done deal. Until she's naked in my bed or yeah. in the contracts in my this fucking account. That's eight, it. Until yep. the cash is in the account. Yep. Till the cash is in the account. I meant to say cash. So. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, my point is so that's why even with military acts, I was super paranoid he was gonna have a second. You know, because people like in the moment you're on the phone with them and they're feeling pumped and jazz, and all of a sudden you hang up and they're driving to go do it and they go. That voice comes on and says, maybe this isn't such a good idea. Like, what are you really gaining out of doing this? You're putting your family's life in jeopardy. You're, you know, for Buzz Aldrin, he was like, my story is not going to change anything anyway. And it's going to jeopardize, undoubtedly, my efforts to get money, right. to, to raise money for, you know, with Congress to, to develop rockets that are going to put citizens in space. That was his whole thing. So anyway, my point is, is that... Like I've said a million times, it ain't it ain't over till you got the till the cat's in the bag. Well, speaking of it ain't over, what's what's this next documentary you got going? Because it sounds like you're building on yeah, so the phenomenon more than anything. Yeah, well, at least some of the people you talked with in there, I should say. I'm sorry. I've met with a lot of military people who have personally handed over unambiguous, crystal clear, broad daylight footage of UFOs. UFOs chasing rockets at Vandenberg Air Force Base, Atlas rockets, UFOs mm. landing at Edwards Air Force Base circa 1957, um, photographic evidence from, from Phoenix, both civilian, primarily military, that gets handed over to some unknown government agency. So I've been hearing this for a while. And I can pack, I can back it up with proof of on camera, you know, that I've taken personally from the witnesses who personally handled the physical taped evidence over to the government. So I've been hearing this for a while. Then I meet with Senator Harry Reid, and he confirms with me that what's been released, what's been seen, what is known, is only the tip of the iceberg. Okay, mm -hmm. so all that's swirling around in my head. And I know it from, you know, the military guys that handled it. I know it got a confirmation of the guy that ran the secret UFO Pentagon program who launched it, Senator Harry Reid, who confirms it on camera. Kind of a big deal. Uh, so then I'm traveling to Brazil about this alleged UFO crash. And now we're talking bodies. Mm. And we're talking debris. And I find out when we're there that it all went to the United States. So what am I thinking? Where is it? Who has the authority to release it? So I want to go pound the streets in D.C. I want to address these rumblings of recovered debris and bodies, which has been happening. You can look it up. Even in the New Yorker, I think in 2019, there's talk about it. So Reed has talked about it. Mm. There's people part of Roswell that have talked about it. There's rumblings, very credible people that are talking about recovered material. There's laboratories that are apparently analyzing some of this material. There's that leaked memo by um, 
Davies um, about recovered material. So it's been, uh, you know, the, the curtain's been drawn back a little bit. I want to find out where is this evidence? Who has the authority to release it? Because ultimately that's the natural transition from where I've been, where my thought process has been, and where this needs to go. Look, we're going to move, we're going to move forward on the assumption the phenomenon's real. That's been established. That's been beaten to death. Where's the evidence? Who has the authority to release it? Is it in the hands of the private sector? Is it free from oversight from, from the members of Congress? There's a new law signed in, I'm uh, sorry, a new act signed into law that basically, in a s- simplified explanation, provides immunity for witnesses to come forward mm-hmm. without fear of prosecution or violating the national security oath. That's it. That was signed into law, I think, a day before Christmas, something like that. Just, and you're you're making this one with Christopher Mellon? Uh, you know, I'm having help with people. Gotcha. Yes, on the inside. I'm, I've got I've got help with people. Yes. So, you know, we'll see how far I get. Um, this is potentially some of the most guarded secrets, but you know, uh, we're not going to get anything if we don't go in there and try. So. Right. And that's and, a crazy one, though. That's yeah. like going right to and the belly a, of the beast. It's going to the belly of the beast, and and you know maybe it's time. Maybe it's time, and I think there are some people out there. And and this recent bill that passed that was signed into law just a couple of weeks ago, um, it, it it would provide immunity. And I'm I'm hearing that there are already people queuing up to go through the process to, and it's got to get approved with Congress and stuff like that. But believe me, there are members of Congress that want the truth out too. So, the intelligence people, the people with the goods, are more are less inclined to want this out. They're going to have egg all over their are. face, and it doesn't really. That it doesn't benefit them in any way f- coming this up. But people have had it. You know, there's a new, you know, the people from the 40s and 50s have died off, and there's a new generation of people that want this out. There's some that don't, obviously. But, um, yeah, so that's that's pretty much what I want to go after. So you're going to film that this year with the idea of putting it out in 2023? Yeah. Uh, 2023, 2024, in the next year or so. To do, you I'll were do saying you want to you try to do one every try. other year But now. listen, when you finish a movie... Yeah. You've got deliverables. Mm-hmm. You've got sound design. You've got sound composition. You've got sound mix. You've got color correction. Mm-hmm. You got, then you get in the queue. You make the deliverables to the distribution company, whoever that might be. Not and, Discovery. Well, yeah, not Discovery. <laughs> and then there's like a three, four, five month processing waiting where they build all the data, they get the. Um, all the subtitles done, all the different languages, all the, you know, that takes time. It's a lot, yeah. It takes time. So even if I finished the film within a year and got it in the queue, that takes time once it's in the queue to actually officially release it. You got to get all the press stuff written. You got to get, that takes time. Yeah, you got a moment of contact done quite, like they did well, like that whole process. I did. And I'd like, if I can, if I can follow that Parallel. Look, I'm not going to compromise the integrity of right. the product. Right. I'm not going to rush this thing to get out. If I've got opportunity to get some higher level interviews, guess what? I'm going to wait. <clears throat> I'm going to go to DC for a month. I'm going to shoot all of the stuff that I need to get, me standing up, me walking through the halls of Congress, all the B-roll, all the time lapse, all that stuff. And then if I have to go back a few times for follow-up interviews for a sit-down, Fuck it. boom, just go in there and do it. Yeah. I've already got all the other layouts. I'm good. Yeah. Well, there's... There are a couple things from the first podcast that we did today. We've been going for hours and hours and hours. The longest podcast I've done in my life. I'm going to leave them on the table and blue ball some people and not go there. I know I had said, like, there were two things I wanted to bring up to you. We addressed one. I never got to the second. If Mm. I go to the second, we're going to be here for another two hours. So I don't want to do that. What I want to close with is something I was getting at maybe 10, 15 minutes ago. But we didn't go all the way. And that is... If we do find out, let's even put it, let's even put a timestamp on it. If we do find out in the next decade that aliens exist, I won't even say that they're here, but that they've been here and we have that definitive proof we've talked about. What how do you think that that'll affect humanity? Like will 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 there be more peace because of that? Will that bring people together or do you think that this could be an existential crisis moment and it could go the way of, I don't know how, but it could go the way of, for example, what some of those people warned 
some of the witnesses like, oh, the population would collapse or something like that. Like, how would you, it's an impossible question, but I'm still going to ask it. Like, how would you see it going? <clears throat> I've thought about this a long time. And, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan had made a couple of statements regarding the effect that he felt if there was an extraterrestrial presence or threat or uh, from the outside, that it would have a very unifying effect. And I tend to agree with him on that. Mm -hmm. I think that we would stop looking at ourselves as pink, white, green, and yellow and start looking at ourselves for who we really are. And that's one race, one species, one planet. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, believe, I believed it then and I still believe it now. So I personally think once we got over the fear of the unknown, and the shock of it all, I think there's been a, a you know, priming the public for some time now. I, I feel that, uh, you know, once we get over the fear of that, that people would accept it. We still got to take out the garbage and do the dishes and go to job and make money. But that we would just, uh, it would give us a bigger perspective on a, on a bigger, uh, as part of this, uh, just a bigger universe with so many different possibilities. So if it was here to do us harm, we would have known that a long time ago. Mm. I so, tend to agree with that. I, I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. Unless they're among us. Unless they're uh, like completely among but us. But I mean, you know, I, you know, is there, is it all benign and happy? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it isn't. But for the most part, all the military and the civilian encounters that I have spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot all around the world, China and Africa and South America, Australia, Canada, all over, all across the United States, Mexico, um, they, the encounters have been benign. In fact, we are the ones that have taken a hostile posture against unknowns. We've tried to shoot at them. We, uh, so... Um, Maybe it doesn't affect them. Yeah, so, you know, that's... Hmm. Uh, we're, we're the ones. I don't think we're no longer taking that hostile posture. We're not shooting at them anymore. It's never ended well for us to try to do that. So... Um, yeah, again, if they were here to do us harm, we would have known a long time ago. I'm, I'm not really worried about that. I mean, I, look, I'm, I'm sure there are people listening to this podcast that are going to just beg to differ, and that's fine. Yeah. I'm just giving you my perspective from my based on my research. Yeah. We, we could go on for hours. We could go on for hours. That's a great answer, though, and I, and I hope you're right. I hope it would be something that unifies and, and like, everything would be cool. Like, you know, we're, we don't know what we're dealing with, but people can get the phenomenon – moment of contact i was calling it a moment of contact earlier. i don't know why i put yep. the a in there but phenomenon and the phenomenon and moment of contact on apple amazon and i will put the link to, yeah. to these in the description if as well you, if you want to rent it rent it from amazon both of them it's the cheapest if you want to buy it do it from itunes or vimeo because you get for the same price you get like an hour or two of bonus material. Excellent. Okay, so I'll have those links in there, and we're going to look for another documentary you're working on either in 2023 or 2024. If people haven't liked, commented, and subscribed to the show, please do that now, and I'm really glad we did this. Thank you so much for coming down here. This was fucking awesome. It was really great. It was worth the drive. It was. It, we're going to make it worth your time. <laughs> Don't worry. We got it. But awesome. I appreciate you, sir. Uh, yeah, of course. And your work's amazing, and I can't wait for the next one. We will support on here. It's... Uh, pretty fucking cool what oh, you got yourself in the middle thank of. you thank you i uh, got a few year, good more years left in me i think i think i think you're just getting started <laughs> and we're going to talk to my security guy too so. All right, cool. anyway everybody else you know what it is give it a thought get back to me peace